Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Fantasy Fangirls Podcast, where two sisters dive deep into beloved fantasy lore, characters, theme series, and more. I'm Lexi. And I'm Nicole. And today is our episode two deep dive of A Court of Silver Flames by Sarah J. Mass, where we're covering chapters five through 11. As always, friends, let's start with our content warning. While we're focusing today's discussion on chapters five through 11 of Silver Flames, all of our episodes include spoilers for the entire book and the Akatar series as a whole. Also, while the majority of each Silver Flames episode does not include spoilers for the rest of Sarah J. Mass's series, our deep dive of this book will continue in our Mass vs. Madness segment. At the end of every episode, we will give a big spoiler warning before we bring in references from other SJM books, specifically the Crescent City series. So if you don't know why Eris's soldiers are missing after acting mighty funny then you might want to go finish the book. We will be here when you're done. Next, we have Fantasy Fangirls, our adults who say adult things about adult books. In other words, friends, this podcast is rated R, especially with Silver Flames. Did you know, Lexi, it could be any time of day, dawn's first light, in the bath, or even after a long, hard day of practice. What? I'm talking about reading, obviously. (laughs) But Cassian sure isn't. No, he is not. (laughs) (laughs) Do be mindful of those little listening ears. Also, friendly reminder, as we deep dive Silver Flames in particular, we recognize this book is divisive among the fandom, and it's okay for this community to have different opinions about characters and perspectives. With that said, please do be respectful both to us and to others as the conversation continues on other channels. Additionally, we are so excited to see you at upcoming live events. Come dance and talk theories with us at the Swords and Shadows Masquerade by Mountains of Magic in Highlands Ranch, Colorado on November 23rd, 2024. We also cannot wait to ring in the new year at the New Year's Eve Fantastic Drop Party in Denver, Colorado. We are partnering with Barnes & Noble for the Onyx Storm Midnight Release Party on January 20th, 2025 in Glendale, Colorado. And we have so much in store as podcast partners at Romanacy Book Con in Los Angeles on February 20th through 22nd in 2025. And last but not least, we cannot wait to be featured guests at Enchanticon in St. Louis, Missouri on August 15th through 17th, 2025. 2025. Links to all of these, including more information, tickets, some including discount codes, are all included in the show notes. And lastly, if you love fantasy fangirls and have been loving this Akatar series journey we're on together, if you want more content, more community, more events, and just more all around, please check out our Patreon. We have three tiers that you can join. The Valkyries, which includes access to our Boppin' Discord, live Q&As from Lexi and I, a book club, including exclusive author interviews like the one this Friday that we have with Sharissa Weeks, community events, promo codes for live events, plus a 20% off discounted merch link to our store. That's for $5 a month. You can also join the High Fae, which includes everything from the Valkyrie level, plus early access to ad-free episodes, our full episode outlines, and special voting privileges. That's for $10 a month. And of course, we have our Inner Circle, which includes everything from the first two tiers, plus behind-the-scenes content, a welcome gift, giveaways, private Discord channels, your name shouted out on the podcast, and that is for $25 a month. Join the party at patreon.com slash fantasyfangirls. The link is, of course, also in the show notes. And really and truly, friends, thank you so much for supporting us as we've turned this podcast into our livelihood. It's literally all because of you. And now it's time to go be social and meet some new friends. To kick off every episode, Nicole does us the honor of summarizing what happens in this stretch of chapters. So gather around, friends. We need an inner circle debrief for Silver Flames chapters 5 through 11. Chapter 5, in the dining room of the House of Wind, it's time to get our daily protein before our first day of training school which has Nesta in a foul mood. Nothing a little banter won't fix, right, Ness? The more Uber picks up Nesta and Cassian and takes them to Windhaven, where Cassian steps into the training ring. Nesta, however, looks over and it's not just a boulder. It's a rock. And she plants her ass down on it, causing the Illyrians to watch their leader get taken down a peg, embarrassing and enraging Cassie in chapter six. Despite being a delight, Nessa has a front row seat to the show. The Cassian exercise show, that is. The more Uber winnows in and with a quick fuck you, they leave the Illyrian mountains, literally dumping Nesta at the House of Wind and then angrily yeeting away from her. Nesta goes on to her second task of the day, but this one she actually participates in. At the House of Wind library, Nesta receives 
receives her daily task from Clotho, and she dives into the menial work. Later, in the dining room, Nesta sits alone and realizes, oh, I guess Cassian is really pissed at me. So she demands wine from the house. But this Disney Channel original movie, Smart House Pat, says nah, bitch. So Nesta goes to get her own. Chapter 7. In the human lands, Cassian heads to meet up with Lucian, Jurian, and Vasa. But there's a surprise guest. Eris! Yay! Turns out that Eris' soldiers have gone missing and in their place. A smelly smell that smells smelly humans. So he's wondering if Vasa knows anything about the other queens wanting to start another war. Who would want that? Brie Allen, that's who. The queen stirring the pot across the sea. Not the cauldron pot because she's got T-Swift bad blood with it after it turned her young body into an old crone. But is there someone working behind the scenes whispering into Brie Allen's ear and helping her with this immense power? Who would do such a thing? Death Lord Coast J, that's who. But enough book plot set up. Cassian heads out and Eris stops him because there's more to the story. Eris sent his soldiers off with his father to the continent. Why? Oh, because fuckface Baron High Lord of Autumn wants prime Prithian real estate and will ally with Briallen to make it happen. Baron, there are better realtors. When Eris' soldiers returned, though, they were acting mighty funny and then they vanished. Odd! What could that mean? Chapter 8. Back at the House of Wind, Nesta gets some inspiration from Miley Cyrus's The Climb and heads to the stairs. She can totally do 10,000, right? Nope. She makes it to 111 before her legs gas out and she has to turn around and basically crawl back up. I don't think that's what Miss Montana was singing about. Someone meets her at the top of the stairs though it's Cassian and he's staring down at her on her knees not in that way but he taunts her that if she wants to make it past 111 steps come to training this has nothing to do with the fact that he also just wants to see her in leather pants again the next morning in the dining room, Nesta is sore, and Cassian can tell immediately. Cockblock Azriel comes in, and the three of them have delightful conversation around breakfast, filled with Cassian teasing Nesta about masturbation and innuendos to quote as, you're in deep shit. Back in Illyria, Nesta heads right back to her not a boulder, it's a rock, and sits her ass down. After an hour of the sweaty Cassian show, Cassian has some work to attend to, so Nesta goes to the village. Chapter 9. In a small shop, Nesta meets Emery, the shop owner, and they have a pleasant conversation, including insulting the Illyrian babies, the number one way into Nesta's friendship circle. Later back at library duty, Nesta is assigned to level five, aka deep in the bowels of the library, where she meets another friendly face, Gwyneth Baldara, one of the library priestesses. Two pleasant conversations in one day must be a good omen. Chapter 10. Later that night in the private library, the smart house Pat feeds Nesta with a double chocolate cake that Cassian steals a few bites of, and he's wondering why she's talking to the house. He's clearly not a Disney Channel original movie kid. In the middle of the night. Nesta wakes up after a nightmare and needing to calm down her raging powers coming to the surface. She runs to the stairs and proceeds to fall right down them, not without a spark or two coming from her hands. What could that mean? The next morning at training, Nesta is yet again on her not a boulder, it's a rock, but this time with a black eye from her tumble down the stairs, which it turns out Cassian saw the whole fall. Cassian, in one more effort to get Nesta to train, reaches his hand out to her. And despite her wanting to get up, Nesta stays on her rock. Chapter 11. That night in the dining room, oh my god, Nesta reluctantly joins Asriel and Cassian for dinner, and it's all going fine until Nesta insults the High Lord of Night, causing Cassian to snap and mention how everyone hates her. Whoops! That night, a brooding Cassian is greeted by Feyre, and something dawns on him. Nesta always is saying, I'm not training at that miserable village. What if they trained here at the House of Wind instead? Light bulb activated. What's one of the most important things you can do for your day-to-day health? Cassian, are you listening for what to do after those workouts? You stay hydrated. But hydration isn't just about chugging a gallon of water a day. No, no. You also need plenty of electrolytes to replenish yourself. Enter Element. Element is an electrolyte solution that has enough sodium, potassium, and magnesium to get you feeling and performing your best. I mean, you know me. I love my Element so much. Me too. Much. <laughs> One of my favorite things is that when we're traveling, especially with all the traveling we're doing in 2025, or as we're even just traveling to Denver for the live show coming up, Element is so easy to take on the go. It comes in these little packets that you can fit into any bag or even a pocket. Yes, even girl pockets. You can fit them in. (laughs) Element has zero sugar, artificial flavors, or other dodgy ingredients to hold you back, yet it still packs in the flavor. You know how much we love our Element flavors. There are so many to choose from. My absolute favorite is always going to be watermelon salt, although I also love all of their citrus options, like their citrus salt, their orange salt. Raspberry salt is another fantastic one. Nicole, I know the mango chili is 
your absolute go-to. But seriously, we could just list off all the flavors because they're all amazing. Element came up with a fantastic offer for our listeners. Get your free sample pack with any Element purchase at drinkelement.com slash FFG. Be sure also to try the new Element Sparkling, which... You've heard us talk about we love our Element Watermelon Sparkling, especially, which is a bold 16-ounce can of electrolyte sparkling water that is perfect for on the go. It's time to step into the cauldron and discuss key insights, character analysis, lore, foreshadowing, theories, and oh, so much more. It's Nesta's first official day at the House of Wind Rehab, where she'll spend the morning training with Cassie and Hu at Windhaven, and then the afternoon working in the library beneath the House of Wind. And it's breakfast time in the dark. Dining room with Cassian. Get ready for us to say that a lot in this book. It brings me back to the good old Akatar days, but now it's a dining room with Cassian instead of Tamlin. So I'm just like a happy, happy girl. I'm so giddy right now. <laughs> We're also about to read some very different scenes in this book in the dining room, and I'm happy. That's what makes me a happy girl. (laughs) Step one of this new life, eat foods that give Nesta consistent energy to ensure she feels good throughout her morning workout. Sorry, Nesta, that means no toast or sugar for your porridge. While Cassian is telling her about the foods that keep her energized during the day, I literally wrote in my notes, nutritionist Cassian reporting for duty. But given his role and his level of fitness knowledge, it makes sense that this would be something he just knows right off the bat, like he's been doing it for 500 years. Exactly. And this also isn't the first time he stepped into this role for an Archeron sister either. Back in Akamath, when Feyre started training, he and Moore gave her nutrition help so that she could gain back her weight to, quote, become strong and swift again. However, Nesta doesn't really really see this as helpful advice, but rather, <laughs> <Shocking. shocking. laughs> but rather yet another way that he and the rest of the night court are taking control over her life. And as we talked about last episode, and probably will be a theme, especially for Nesta during these early episodes, Nesta always feels like the control over her life was in other people's hands, especially her mother's growing up. So the night court is literally ripping away the last semblance of control that she did have over her life. And it's Nessa's number one childhood trigger getting set off. And here it is again in the dining room. Additionally, Nesta's lack of appetite in these early chapters is a direct result of her mental health. From chapter four, quote, her appetite had been the first thing to go after that battle. Only instinct and an occasional social requirement to appear like she gave a shit about anything kept her eating. As a result, Nesta is malnourished, but she hardly even notices and she certainly doesn't care. Cassian recognizes that she doesn't eat because this is another subconscious way of Nesta punishing herself and internalizing her trauma. Here at breakfast, he even calls out that he understands what this is really about as both a way to cut through the bullshit with Nesta and his attempt to assure her that she isn't the first or last to go through this. Quote, you think I haven't gone through what you're dealing with? You think I haven't seen and done and felt all that before and seen those I love deal with it too? In other words, this isn't Cassian's first rodeo. So if she's going to have an attitude, then he's going to respond to it with tough love. In this instance, he doesn't care if she's mad at him as long as she eats a healthy breakfast and begins nourishing her body. That and he just wants to give her signs of having another true emotion rather than feeling this void. This is not unlike how Reese made Feyre angry, especially in the early days of Akamath, when she was feeling nothing but numbness and void. And he was like, well, let me just make you pissed off by flirting with you. And this is exactly what Cassian is doing here. Exactly. It is time for another Fit Watch. First day of training edition. Nesta is wearing Illyrian fighting leathers and with her hair braided into almost like a crown, like a tiara. Yes, I am counting this as a queen moment. 13 is now our queen count. This is also her first time wearing pants since the final battle of Akawar, and she's forgotten that feeling of almost nakedness having her thighs so clearly on display. You know who has that image burned into his brain again? That's Cassian, my boy. Because seeing Nesta in pants is enough to make something else happen in his own pants. Sir, (laughs) calm down. (laughs) And then he goes on to be like, oh no, I can't afford a distraction like that. He is trying to be respectful of Nesta's wishes and her mental state, but also that primal mate instinct is like, I want you so bad. This is how I imagine Reese's POV was for like the first half of Akamath. (laughs) Fingers crossed that some day we get that delicious POV because I I need that more than a person should. Cassian's mind also naturally goes to good God, when was the last time I got laid? And don't worry, because he immediately remembers. It was before Feyre had freed 
under the mountain when Cassian had met another female at Rita's and they went at it like animals in an alley. Quick and dirty and done in minutes. As Nesta goes to leave the dining room, Cassian reaches out to grab Nesta's arm and this moment where they touch, it's almost like the mating bond quickly is pushed to the surface. And so are other moments where they have gotten this close before. Nesta recalls the final battle with those lingering words that never got any closure hanging over the two of them. But also we get a quick flashback for a moment that is technically not even in an Akatar book and is from an Akamath bonus chapter. I remember reading this for the first few times because I didn't know the Akamath bonus chapter existed. And I was like, did I miss something? When did he nuzzle her neck? I really do love SJM's bonus chapters. We're going to discuss Asriel's at length during this deep dive because they are so packed with information and they give us a lot of clues and theories. However, if you don't know about them, like I didn't at the time, you would be like, what the hell is happening? Like, I guarantee you in a new Akatar book, like in Akatar 6 or 7 even, we're going to get mentions of the jewelry that Asriel secondhand gifts to Gwen. And if you don't know about that bonus chapter, it would be like, wait, when did that happen in Silver Flames? I don't remember. The moment that Nesta remembers from that bonus chapter, though, is when he nuzzles her neck and licks up her throat during the check-in between human queen visits in Akama. This is all also when Nesta was still human. She manages in that moment to kick him in the balls in this scene, which I guarantee you gave her so much confidence when it comes to going toe-to-toe with Cassian in this book. Cassian remembers, however, back at winter solstice when she told him, quote, I've made my thoughts clear enough on what I want from you, aka I want nothing to do with you. As they both give these moments of callback, Nesta goes to the moments where they were almost together, which feels like yet another way to punish herself. Here's this great thing that almost happened in your life, but you don't deserve the happiness it would have brought you. And Cassian recalls the moments where The thought of them together was being pushed further and further away, which Cassian believes on some level, it's him that she does not want, when the opposite is actually true and it's really just to punish herself. I do want to call out the fact that this logic also punishes Cassian, and I don't think Nesta is thinking about that. But I think there's part of her that believes he'll find someone else who does deserve him, and that is just one more way she'll punish herself, having to watch him fall in love with another female. It's not like he's arrogant enough to be like, oh, her no's mean yeses and she really does want me. That's not Cassian at all here. But he does recognize that she's wielding her words to protect herself from emotion and connection. And that's what he's holding on to in their interactions. I absolutely love forced proximity banter. I think a lot of us do. And it's almost like these two start this game of winning and losing rounds. For instance, Nesta eating to make Cassian keep his fucking opinions to himself. Having a reason that benefits her by her standards is important to keep that sense of control over when and what she eats. Cassian's also glad to see that she woke up ready to play. In other words, ready to show emotion, ready to go head to head with him. As she realizes her words about don't touch her and that he's a brute don't at least seem to land like the insult she intends them to be, she goes in for the kill. Quote, if you think this training nonsense is going to result in you climbing into my bed, you're delusional. (laughs) This is less than a page after she recalls his dying promise to her from the battlefield that he would find her in the next life and that they would have the time he regrets they didn't have in this world. She knows how he feels about her and she is shoving it in his face that she does not want him because he is not worth her time. Nesta snickers in victory, relishing in his admittance that no, he won't climb into her bed. But then record scratch you'll climb into mine. As much as this banter just makes me kick my feet and squeal, I have to point out that she will ultimately be right in this scenario. He will climb into her bed first. (laughs) Damn straight. (laughs) I feel like it's only fitting to start keeping a scoreboard for these two. It'll be really hard to keep that up throughout this entire deep dive, but let's at least try. So right now, I'm going to say it's Nesta zero, Cassian one. Would you agree? Absolutely, I would agree. Yeah, okay. (laughs) You'll climb into mine is like, even though we know foreshadowing wise, it's not ultimately true. I want to look at the scoreboard as with the information that we have up until this point. Oh, definitely. Yes. And him getting the last word of you'll climb into mine is absolutely a point in Cassian's favor. Especially because she just thought that she won that round. Exactly. Which (laughs) immediately takes her down a point. One of my favorite things about this book is how Cassian plays with her. It is not unlike how Reese played with Feyre in Akamath. It's just like flirting to get any emotion out of her, even if it's anger, even if it is that playing. Like this is the banter I fucking love. I love the shit. Nesta, however, arrives at Windhaven because it is time to train. The more Uber winnows both Cassian and Nesta to the 
bitterly cold Illyrian Mountains, where Nesta immediately notices the small stone and pine houses making up the small village. Hello, Emery foreshadowing. We get that village where shops are going to be. But it's not the village time yet. Instead, they are in front of the fighting rings and Cassian chooses the one furthest away. I love this little detail because he already has the inkling that she wants to be as far from sight as possible. She does not want this to be a spectacle, even though she makes it one by not training. It probably also has to do with the fact that this is not a friendly welcome. Well, let's talk about that. I've wondered why part of this plan for Nesta included training at Windhaven, of all places. Yeah. It requires one of the Inner Circle members, like Reese or more, who Nesta definitely does not like, to winnow them to and from the Illyrian Mountains every single day. And the Illyrians have deep-set prejudices against females as they've already shown when Devlin accused Nesta of being a witch the one time she did visit before in Akawar. I think this is supposed to illustrate how little Reese knows Nesta and it'll compare to how much Cassian does understand her and is willing to accommodate because as he'll say there's nothing wrong with her. It's that everyone else is trying to fit her into this predetermined box. Perhaps Reese also thought Windhaven would be appropriate because it gets Nesta out of the house of wind every day and he figured going to an Illyrian war camp is better than being stuck at the house all day every day between training there and the library located below. Or he thought because Nesta is so much like the Illyrians, she would fit in with training among them. Reese has literally said she is like an Illyrian. She is a warrior at heart after all. But what Reese did not take into account is how much Nesta hates showing any sort of vulnerability. We will be saying that a lot this episode. So he didn't look at this from the angle of her being a complete beginner. He just kind of thought of it maybe being her as already one of the Illyrians. Since this was such a quick turnaround from laying out the plan to putting the ultimatum into action, I'm just going to assume no one else like Thera or Cassian or even Elaine considered a better alternative. Plus, and this is what I really think too here, is Reese's other motive was to make the Illyrians warm up to the idea of a female training and seeing Nesta train will inspire the females at Windhaven. After all, Reese and Cassian have struggled with getting the camps to train females for decades and it's especially been unsuccessful since they were trying extra hard in Frost and Starlight. I assume they had to pump the brakes on training females to solve the unrest. Sure. Sure. <laughs> this is also where my mind immediately went. It's almost like Reese was like, oh, there's two birds and one stone and we can just knock them up both out. I also think he, Cassian and Asriel all came into their own at the Illyrian camps. Oh, yes. So maybe he was thinking along those lines as well of like, well, if she is very similar to us in that way, this would be a good place for her. But I agree with you completely. He was not thinking and I don't think anyone was thinking about her absolute distaste of showing any sort of vulnerability. Yes, Nesta immediately does not feel welcome at Windhaven. Everyone, including the dozens of males currently training, stop what they're doing and watch when they arrive. No warmth, no smiles. And Devlin really brings the welcome party when his first words to them are, what's her business here? I'm sorry. Just from that, I wouldn't want to train around any of these people either. I already am terrified to just go to the gym and try to do any kind of training. And that's not like... <laughs> I'm going to take you to my Orange Theory classes one day and you're going to have so much fun. I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> But points for Nesta to smile and reply with witchcraft. It goes back to our Akawar speculation that Nesta actually identifies and embraces the idea of being a witch because it gives a label for her with unique and deadly powers and it makes others fear her. It also is a friendly reminder for us readers that witches do exist in this world, which has me losing my mind. <laughs> we learn that the Illyrians are a superstitious bunch. Devlin demands that any weapon she touches will be buried afterward. And if Nesta is on her period, ah, God forbid, She's not allowed to touch the weapons at all. Boo, you suck, Illyrian misogynists. Gold star for Cassian as he sticks up for Nesta and how these are outdated superstitions. But again, this is understandably not an environment for a female just starting out her training who is not accustomed to Illyrian culture and who already doesn't want to be there. Well, we all know how this training goes. Nesta, rather than following Cassian into that farthest ring, she goes to perch on a rock with her only words of, quote, I told you I'm not training to slap in his face. But don't worry, she's technically attending training. But as she will tell Cassian, she will not lift a finger. 
oh, this is where it starts to get bad, which causes the surrounding Illyrians to watch the spectacle on display. This refusal, it's not just a slap in the face to Cassian in regard to the agreement that she trains in the mornings. She's refusing the commander's orders, and as a result, she's humiliating him in front of Illyrians he's been trying to prove his worth to for centuries. Ah, exactly. Prior to them starting their training session, Cassian had that quick chat with Devlin, where Devlin basically scoffed and dismissed Cassian. Cassian's already been knocked down a peg by someone who was under his command. And yet here is another person not showing him respect and actively ignoring his orders. It is not hard to think what message this sends to the other Illyrian warriors at the camp, that Cassian can indeed be disobeyed. The Illyrians value strength above all else. I mean, think about how you get the siphon, you know, for instance, they value purebred strength above all else. I should amend that statement. And it looks like Cassian isn't strong enough in this moment. And it's made even worse by the fact that he's being shown up by a female, which in Illyrian culture, want to be very specific there, the Illyrian males already don't view Illyrian females on the same playing field. So here is a female above all else knocking down their high general. It breaks my heart how there's a slight plead in his eyes as he snarls at her to get up. He's both mortified and begging her to do this for him, if not for herself, and she's just throwing him to the wolves. No wonder, quote, something like disgust filled his face. Disappointment. Anger. Nesta L. Capital L. Full stop. And as we always do on this podcast, let's get in her shoes a little bit and look at why on earth she would humiliate poor Cassie in this way. Like, this is so aggravating. And most of it can be summarized in this one sentence. Quote, good. Let him see what a waste of life, what an utter wretch she'd become. Nesta wants Cassian to give up on her, just like everyone else has, and just like she has given up on herself. She sees his actions, the care that he still has for her, and she subconsciously needs to push him away and get him to hate her, just like everyone else hates her, and she believes she deserves that treatment and fate. And yet, there's that little voice in her head that begs her not to treat him this way. Quote, don't humiliate him like this. Don't give these assholes the satisfaction of seeing him made a fool. Remember, actually, back in Akabor, when people started disrespecting him, she would stand up for him. And he was like, whoa, this is the polar opposite of that behavior. And Nessa's body refuses to get up off this damn, not a boulder, it's a rock. She already has drawn the line. She has stepped back into control of the situation. So her limbs will literally not let her change her mind. Even in these chapters, she remembers that there was a time that she would stand up for him and she's not anymore. And she even acknowledges that personally. So, well, she asks, she's like, what happened to that person? What yes. happened to that version of me? And we'll address that later. It's also important to remember in this moment that Nesta never wants to be looked at like a beginner or a fool, like we said earlier. Remember back at the High Lords meeting, she didn't want to go at first because she would not appear vulnerable. Being a beginner has so much vulnerability to it. And it's why many of us as adults refuse to do it, which is valid. It's also why when she extended that olive branch back to Feyre in Akatar to have Feyre teach her to paint, that was such a big deal. That was Nesta saying, hey, I'm going to be vulnerable with you, which was not something we were used to from that older sister. Jumping ahead here a little to chapter 12, when Cassian realizes Windhaven is the main obstacle to her starting to train, quote, Nesta might be willing to face down the King of Hybern himself, but she was proud as all hell, appearing foolish, making herself vulnerable. She'd rather die, would rather sit on a freezing rock in the icy wind for hours than look like a fool in front of anyone, especially arrogant warriors predisposed to mock any female who attempted to fight like them. Sums it up right there. Again, it does not make her attitude toward Cassian in this moment acceptable whatsoever, but it shines light on why she is outright refusing to participate here at Windhaven. I mean, it's safe to say that Nesta is being as stubborn as stubborn gets. And you know those people who refuse to go to the doctor because they think they're fine or it's just too much of a hassle to get an appointment. Nesta is definitely one of those people. But luckily for her and others, there is ZocDoc, the healthcare app that makes booking a doctor's appointment so much easier. So there's absolutely no excuse. ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare high quality in-network doctors, choose the right one for your 
needs and click to instantly book an appointment. We're talking about in-network appointments with over 100,000 healthcare providers across every specialty, from mental health to dental health, eye care to skin care, and much more. You can filter for doctors who take your insurance, who are located nearby, who are a good fit for any medical need you may have, and who are highly rated by verified patients. You can also see their actual appointment openings, choose a time that works for you, and instantly click to book a visit. Plus, ZocDoc appointments happen fast, like typically within 24 to 72 hours of booking. Wow. You can even score same day appointments. We at Fantasy Fangirls use ZocDoc and you should too. Stop putting off those doctor's appointments and go to ZocDoc.com slash FF to find and instantly book a top rated doctor today. That is Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash FF. ZocDoc.com slash FF. While perched on her rock, that does not stop Nesta from watching Cassie and Train seeing his body move with such precision and lethal deadliness. She literally cannot tear her eyes away. Yes, this is absolutely mates foreshadowing. And I also believe that this is foreshadowing that there is something deep in her soul that's like, I want to learn the art of fighting. This is like her soul is being called to it. I love it. However, it also brings out this internal tennis match that's going on in her head. She is insistent on sticking to her drawn line, but she also recalls the moment in the war when Cassian begged her to leave him and she wept back to him, quote, I can't, unsaid, I can't leave you. And she wonders where that person went, that person who was brave, who showed such high levels of care and love for another and so much so that she would follow him to death. And now she can't even get up a fucking rock to help him. I'm going to say with this training session, we're probably at Nesta one, Cassian one. I think you're right. And I don't want it to be right, but I, I know, know you are. I it's know. Right. It's yeah. not a point that I like giving her because she doesn't even want the point, but she does want the point. And- it's a point with an L. It's a point with a tisk. Bad, <laughs> Nesta. Bad. No good. (laughs) Two hours later, Morgan catches Nesta sitting on the rock and obviously not training, despite Nesta's lie that she's taking a break. This plays right into Moore's perception of Nesta that we were talking about last episode. And indeed, most other times, Moore and Nesta are on the page together. By the way, I love the little details of knowing you're in one person's POV by the names they use for others, like how Nesta calls Reese Resand and Moore Morgan as her own way of distancing herself from them and not accepting them as friends. Moore left her feelings for Nesta known, and you can just feel the bad blood between these two through the page. We talked last episode about how Moore feels Nesta would do well in the Court of Nightmares, and probably one of the reasons she personally doesn't like Nesta is because she reminds her of the Court of Nightmares. Moore all but confirms that here, outright saying to Nesta that she knew people like her once. In other words, people from the Hewn City who hurt and traumatized Moore. She continues to Nesta, quote, you never deserve the benefit of the doubt that good people like him give you. Whew. As much as Moore is within her rights to be blunt here to Nesta, especially when she sees Nesta refusing to participate in training, she is wrong. And that's just a fact from what we see with Nesta later in this book here, and even what we're seeing with Nesta's internal monologue here too. But understandably, Moore is over Nesta and doesn't feel like she deserves the chance the rest of the inner circle is giving her, especially the time, effort, and heart that Cassian is putting into this. Plus, Moore recognizes how emotionally attached Cassian is to Nesta, and like Nicole has been saying, Moore hates that someone, least of all Nesta, is taking away Cassian. Nesta is shaking up the dynamic that she, Cassian, and Azriel have had for five centuries. So she already has an uphill battle to get on Moore's good side. Then with it being, you know, Nesta, look, while we all know her underlying issues, I absolutely cannot blame Moore for her attitude right now. I also cannot blame Moore for her attitude right now because she really hates Nesta and she's only seen the side of Nesta that is vicious and cruel. When Moore tells her that her vote was to dump Nesta in the human lands, Oh boy, Nesta says, quote, Oh, I know. Good thing being Feyre's sister has its advantages. This is the spoiled bitch that Moore, and I would even believe to say Reese, thinks Nesta to be on full display. And also, Nesta's taunting her in this moment, too. Like, she doesn't like being Feyre's sister, and everybody knows that. But hey, she's going to use it to her advantage, and she's just taunting more with it. Oh, I can like feel Moore's blood boiling. And again, I do not blame her. 
However, this part of Windhaven is only half of Nesta's new daily routine. Part two takes place in the library of the House of Wind. Nesta recalls how the last time she was here was over a year ago, when the ravens snuck into Valaris and chased Feyre and Nesta down to the lower levels, where Nesta then escaped due to her little sister's distraction, and Nesta ran right to Cassian. And that's as far as that memory will go, slicing off the thought. I love that word that she uses, slicing. She has had her first day of training and her inner monologue is already choosing words like slice. I love it. It's so good. Her reasoning for going to the library afternoon assignment isn't because she wants to or because she's driven by fear of getting thrown into the human lands if she doesn't obey. It's because otherwise Nest is stuck here in the House of Wind with nothing to do. And that's the most unbearable thing of all because it means the roaring in her head will sneak up. I may have given Reese in the inner circle a hard time for thinking Windhaven was a good place to train, but I do commend them for the choice in having Nesta go to the library. The library is a sanctuary for females who have endured the worst kind of trauma. Giving Nesta the chance to dull her sharp edges around these females and also identify with them. She's assigned to quiet, purposeful work that is not hard or stressful, but still keeps her mind busy. And like they will say, it balances the physical training she's supposed to be doing. I just really love how the library and training become so integral to her healing journey in different ways. It's just so fitting. Nesta meets Clotho and us readers are reintroduced to her. Clotho is the library's high priestess and the first one brought here by Moore and Reese, who turned this into a sanctuary for females like her. Centuries ago, Clotho was brutally maimed and her attackers deliberately messed up the healing process to make sure she could never say or write who hurt her. Her hands are bones bent and knobbed, fingers at the wrong angles, and her tongue has been cut out. Yaz the Bookish brought up a great bit of information about Clotho in ancient Greek mythology and how this actually may influence Clotho in this series. It's so much fun. I just have to share it with everybody here. In Greek mythology, Clotho was the youngest goddess of the three fates and the one who spun the threads of life. As such, she represented human life and her decisions represented the fate of all people in society. Fate? Fate, you say? There are several instances where Clotho in our story seems to have the ability to see through people's thoughts and feelings, especially with Nesta, as well as with Azrael from his bonus chapter. Perhaps Clotho is connected to fate here in Perithian, manifested in some way into a physical form. And perhaps as much as her attackers were definitely evil fucks, no one is denying that, they were trying to stop her from using her fate powers in some way. The full post Yaz the Bookish did on this, including lots of quotes from the series, series about Clotho and Fate is linked in the show notes. I highly recommend you checking it out for more. Ah, I love that. Meeting another female who has clearly been through such trauma, Nesta starts replaying her own trauma as a movie in her mind, immediately recalling when she was shoved into the cauldron. This is a show don't tell for us readers that Nesta belongs here at this library, which is a place for those with trauma to heal. A few pages later, the words bubble up to Nesta's mind so clearly to herself that she's almost surprised Clotho doesn't hear her thoughts. Quote, I am worthless and I am nothing. I hate everything that I am. And I am so, so tired. I am tired of wanting to be anywhere but in my own head. If I remember correctly, I think that's the first time we really see on the page her acknowledging what she is truly going through versus all of the anger and I'll say like the band-aid emotions that she's trying to put forth instead. This is the first time we really see it written like this. There's a few times where it's got the void language around it and the numbness language, but this is not numb. This is pleading. The feeling of, quote, I'm tired of wanting to be anywhere but in my own head, that is just one of the most relatable things I've ever read. Like I know that you and I I have both had periods of our life where that is the truest statement. And I know many readers who relate to Nesta can remember a similar time for them. I think this is the first time that she truly admits to herself on the page here that she is not worthy. Yeah. Now, it will dawn on Nesta later that she was allowed access to the library, quote, for whatever reason, but there's almost like this breathing of surprise that she was allowed in, like she's too tainted to be here, when in actuality, this is exactly the place that she needs to be, and many other priestesses, like Gwen, feel too tainted to be here as well. Precisely. It goes back to feeling not worthy to start the healing process, like she shouldn't be allowed here because she doesn't deserve to heal, and the priestesses just don't know that yet. Nesta starts small with a simple goal of working for five hours to shelve books back where they're supposed to go. Quote, five hours of work. Nesta could do that. This is the first time she hasn't pushed back at something she is being asked slash forced to do. A big part of it is the impact of innate respect for the priestesses, but also there's this 
why not in her mind? Tying back to what she was thinking earlier, where she doesn't have anything better to do. And we already know Nessa likes books, and the work keeps her mind busy just enough to quiet her roaring thoughts. Again, good points for Reese for thinking about this being part of the plan. Like, I think that if Nessa didn't have this part of her day and it was only devoted to the Illyrian training, I don't think she would have had the journey that she went on. She needed this time of calm and being surrounded by like minded females. And I, I love it. It makes me so happy. I think the physical training is her being able to physically process kind of what she's going through and help regulate her body while the library work is to help her process through her thoughts and her mind yes. and to help regulate her mind. And the two balance each other out. I love it. I love it so much. After a long day, Nesta is hungry for dinner. She doesn't think about it in the moment of like, oh, I'm hungry. Like that's different and weird. But like for us readers, this is a whoa, whoa, whoa. Her appetite is coming back. Huzzah. Yay. (laughs) Her first big day of breaking the previous cycle, it's already bringing back her appetite. Now she will be skipping some other meals throughout the next few days. But the fact that she is hungry at the end of this day, that is a big deal. But it looks like it will be a solitary dinner for Nesta, which she scolds herself for even being surprised that Cassian is not here. This is to remind her that when she pushes people away, there is a big part of herself that believes they'll keep coming back time and time again. And while, yes, Cassian will, he will continue reaching out a hand. This is Nesta getting a bit of, oh, this is a Cassian reality check. He needs time to cool off and he might not come back as quickly as I want him to. And it's so at odds with that smugness that she's telling herself to have. Like earlier before the library, she thought it was easier to break him than she anticipated. And she's smug about it when she's not actually feeling that way. Nesta is scowling at her circumstances and she commands the house for wine and none appears even after several attempts. So she thinks to herself, quote, talking to a house, a new low. Ah, Nesta, not quite. This is the house right here being that friend to her without her even realizing it. The house is, which by the way, I'm going to only refer to the house as Smart House from now on. Probably Smart House Pat. If you are a Disney Channel original movie kid, you will know. Smart House Pat is saying, no, I'm not going to give you wine, but I will give you water. And it's like, I'm going to help you. But sadly, Nesta does not see it that way. She sees it as yet another way of control. Yes. Well, I do also think that Cassian and co were like, don't give her wine. But it is also the house doing what is in Nesta's best interest. You know how I was just saying that this is Nesta's first day of breaking her cycle and we were all excited and we even gave her a huzzah? Well, we're about to see that cycle break in a new way as she tries her favorite coping mechanism we talked a lot about last episode. Nesta is dependent on alcohol emotionally and probably physically too, though I admit that is kind of skirted over in this story. Drinking is so ingrained as her daily habit, especially in the evenings as she needs to escape her own head. What she did today was different than her usual, but at the end of the day, as she settles in by herself with nothing to keep her busy from her thoughts, the craving for wine is immediately there. Which, by the way, if you've read the book Atomic Habits by James Clear, you know that time is one of the triggers for a habit. And right here, we're seeing that on the page. It is evening, therefore the habit of, oh, I need wine is a trigger for her. But once again, control over what she does and And in this case, what she drinks is stripped from her and she won't hear of it. So motivated by the physical craving, the emotional dependency and need to take control back, she heads to the stairs because after all, she was told she's welcome to go to a tavern and get wine if she can make it down the 10,000 steps. How hard can it be? But before we go down that staircase, let's jump back to Cassian. Remember that big promotion about being a courtier, looking into the human queens and dealing with them? During his recent conversation with Moore, Cassian realized that while it's impossible to get too close to the human queens on the continent, our crew does have access to someone who knows these queens inside and out, who can potentially offer Cassian some insight into what they're up to, or honestly, just point the poor guy in any direction. (laughs) Because right now, he's got the most vague and impossible mission. More the Uber winnower drops Cassian off at the Band of Exiles headquarters. And the, I also, wait, real quickly, I love that both of us separately started calling her more the Uber. Like that was not on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> More the Uber winner is her new name. Like that is that is as canon as Lisa for marketing. Like that is perfect. 
More the Uber winnower drops Cassian off at the Band of Exiles headquarters in the human lands below Perithian. He timed it for after sundown since Vasa is a firebird by day and only turns back into a human who can speak at night. More immediately dips out before he can beg her to help. We'll learn it's probably because she can sense Eris, though in this moment Cassian thinks it's because she wants him to play courtier all on his own. I'm guessing the inner circle believes in Cassian in a way he doesn't and has full faith in him that he'll be spectacular without their help. Why won't anyone onboard Cassian? Where is Lisa for marketing? Or is it just assumed that since he's already been working at the company for centuries, he should know what to do? Okay, I just want to point out that this is a common thing. For Nesta, her first day as emissary to the human lands was the High Lords meeting. Feyre, they threw her into the weaver and were just like, good luck, <laughs> like have fun. I also want to point out, I think more at the Valaris Starbucks was the onboarding. Oh, but dear. If- <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. If more was the onboarder, that was the bare, like, you know how when you've like worked at a, or like when you start working at a company, you always have that one onboarder who's like, okay, here's the bare minimum. Got it. Okay, I'm gonna go do my own shit now. That was more. (laughs) But we can't entirely blame the inner circle for this because part of the jump into the thick of this courtiership is driven by Cassian. After today, he's pissed and he needs a distraction and especially needs to get out of the house and work off some anger. Not before he made two pit stops, however. One where he went to a deserted cliff by the sea where he could hear nothing but the roar of the sea to drown out his own rage, yikes, and then to the river house to admit failure and defeat. This is, oh God, this is heartbreaking because Cassian believed in his heart that Nesta wouldn't be like this with him. He knows she's angry and hurting and taking that out on others. But to see just how far she would go, it's proof to him that she is not the same person anymore. So in this all or nothing rage that he's having, he has this moment of, I need to give up because I've truly failed. There is no helping her. I want to be really mindful of pointing out these moments with Cassian. A lot of the fandom has kind of deemed him this like lovesick puppy who lets Nesta walk all over him. And that is so not the case at all. He's furious, not only at Nesta's own behavior and knowing exactly what BS she was pulling back in the Illyrian Mountains, but also that she can turn into this person that he doesn't even recognize. So how do you deal with all this pent up rage? You pour yourself into work, obviously. Lucian greets Cassian, and I love being in Cassian's POV as we interact with characters we've known on the page for so long, but we're getting to experience them from new perspectives. For instance, Cassian does his usual immediate marking the layout for exits, but as he senses Lucian's unease, he recognizes fighting his way out might be a distinct possibility, which, yep, Lucian is tense because Eris is here. And it's never good when Cassian or Azriel are in the same room with Eris based on their history with him. Suddenly, Cassian playing the courtier here in the manor just got way more difficult as he figures out what is safe to share and how to wrangle in his blinding rage toward Eris. Unsuccessfully, as Eris notices and will subtly taunt him. And Lucian's giving Cassian the look of, dude, if I can be cool with him, so can you. Despite Eris holding up his end of the bargain with Reese at every turn, Cassian still can't try him, even though he knows he should by now and that they are indeed allies. Cassian is used to knowing precisely who the enemy is on the battlefield and how to be direct in dealing with the Illyrians. But this is a whole new level of navigating enemy but actually ally territory and keeping his hot-headed temper that does well on the battlefield in check. I talked earlier about Nesta being a beginner. This is Cassian being a beginner as a courtier. And Eris being here is like having to do something for the first time in front of your middle school bully and their middle school bully is mocking you at every turn that you do something wrong. Like, this is horrifying. I would be terrified if I was Cassian. Cassian thought he was coming here and was going to be surrounded by more trusted, I'll say, allies. Who, let's get into those allies, starting with Vasa, Firebird by day, and Queen of Scathia by night which is a tough thing to balance as Jurian notes, quote, last I heard your kingdom was no longer yours. Are you still a queen? Which sounds like a, whoa, good sir. You can't talk to her that way. But we immediately get the subtext that this is just normal banter from them because she rolls her eyes and then looks at Lucian, quote, like the fame male had settled similar arguments between them before. Jurian is part of Vass's court. Based on this, I'm thinking he's almost like kind of hand of the queen, I'll say. And as Lucian notes back in Frost and Starlight, Right? 
Jurian's really good at it, keeping everything running for Vasa while she's, you know, a firebird, to the point that Lucian believes he would have been crowned king by now if it weren't for Vasa already holding the title of queen. But she's also a queen without a home right now. Yes, she's queen of Scathia, which is a human territory on the continent, but it's assumed she can't go back there right now, even with her temporary freedom because of the threat of the other human queens. And I assume also her curse as well. And she's not queen of this realm because this mortal territory does not have royalty, but she's at least putting her leadership skills to use here in a region that desperately needs help after the war. From this one little exchange, we see that these three, Lucian, Vasa, and Jurian, have formed quite a found family. And I still stand by my thruple theory. I swear I can see it. Although I don't think Lucian has acted on it because of, you know, being a mated male and all that kind of stuff yet. But this would slightly be tragic for Lucian's character, which what else is fucking new? Because he would fall in love with humans with human lifespans, assuming that Jurian still has a human lifespan. Although who knows? I don't know. I ship it. (laughs) I ship it. (laughs) So there's definitely something brewing between Lucian and Vasa. We get little hints of that on the page here. But I think Jurian is strictly and happily in the friend zone. I think your Thropple theory is a fun theory. I can't wait to make this a bet when we get to (laughs) Avatar. Are you serious? I think I'm serious. Oh my goodness. I just had the perfect FFG merch idea. Lucian, Vasa, and Jurian friendship bracelets or thruple bracelets, if you will. How cute would that would be? I love that idea. I do love the idea of friendship bracelets. And working with Shopify, Fantasy Fangirl's official merch partner makes it all possible. With Shopify point of sale, you can do it all without complexity. Shopify's point of sale system is a unified command center for your retail business. It brings together in-store and online operations, even across a thousand locations. Imagine being able to guarantee that shopping is always convenient. Endless aisles, ship to customer, buy online, in-store pickup, all made simpler so customers can shop how and where they want. And staff have tools so that they can close the sale every time. And let's face it, acquiring new customers can be expensive. With Shopify POS, you can ensure existing shoppers come back to your store with consistent, tailored experiences and first-party data that gives marketing teams a competitive edge. Want more? Check out at shopify.com slash FFG, all lowercase, and learn how to create the best retail experiences without complexity. That's shopify.com slash FFG. But back to Eris, because we got to ask, what is he unexpectedly doing here at the Band of Exiles headquarters? Well, he's also here to talk to Vasa and Durian. Because several dozen of his soldiers were out on patrol a few days ago and are now missing. Dun, dun, dun. But here's the kicker. His hounds detected strange scents at the site of his soldier's abduction. The scents seem human, but are odd somehow. Side note, these prized hounds are the best in Prithian and can smell any prey. I guess that these are the same hounds that were used on Lucian and Feyre back when they were in the Autumn Court in Akawar, and that's how the Autumn Court bros found them so easily. Definitely. Absolutely. So initially, Eris's question for the crew is whether this could be a result of the lingering tensions between the humans and Fey. Does Durian and Vasa know anything about humans below the wall starting trouble? Durian confirms no, at least not yet. But what about the human queens on the continent? Could they be behind this? The Band of Exiles has also heard how the queens are poised to start trouble. But the question, at least for the Band of Exiles here, is why they would cross the sea, capture autumn soldiers, and leave such the obvious clue of human scent. Maybe to sow tensions between the Perithian courts and weaken them, like the Inner Circle did with the Fey territories in Akawar? Well... Ares actually already knows the answer to this, but he's not sharing it with the class as he tries to detect how much the Band of Exiles knows. It's not until later when him and Cassian are alone that he gives him more of the tea. Baron, the fuck, has already pledged his forces to Briallen after hearing about her ambitions. Ares sent his loyal soldiers, who the ones who are now missing, to the continent with his father for their conspiring meeting so that when they came back, they would share with Ares all the tea that his shady shit father is up to quote they returned with my father but they were 
off, aloof, and strange. They vanished soon after, and my hounds confirmed that the scents of the scene were the same as those gifts Brielle sent to curry my father's favor. Ah, here is the confirmation we readers get on a reread that Brielle already has the crown within her grasp and is already using it on Eris's soldiers. So real quickly here, because we were wondering, I think it was last episode, how in the world Baron found out about her ambitions. It sounds like it's because she was trying to get his favor from the beginning. So maybe she was the one who initially approached him and then he went to her. So, ah, all right then. But back to the moment here with Vasa, Durian, and Lucian. Eris might not tell them about his father allying with Briallen, but he does inform them that the other three queens left the joint palace and Briallen has been residing there alone for weeks. Vasa confirms Briallen, now without the other queens as obstacles to her own ambitions, would absolutely do something as foolish as capture Autumn Court soldiers. But but how does she get the kind of power to winnow across the sea all by herself and make three dozen phase soldiers vanish? As Vasa says, quote, she'd only do this if she had someone of immense power behind her, perhaps pulling her strings. Ah, uh, yes, we're back to the Death Lord Coast J, who we know as the Bone Carver and the Weaver slash Striga's older bro, and it met a true immortal Death Lord. Back in Aquavore episode four, I did a quick backstory on who in Slavic folklore Coast J is and how the story is very similar to that of the Kosje and Akatar. In Slavic folklore, Kosje the Deathless abducts a princess and the hero, Ivan Snosnovich, yes, the son of the pine tree, welcome back to our story, learns one of his weaknesses. It's an egg in a box that is hidden under a mountain. So Ivan Snosnovich, son of a pine tree, digs up the whole mountain, smashes the egg box, and rescues the princess. A quick shout out to our son of a pine tree ugly holiday sweater. It might be my favorite thing I've ever created. <laughs> so real quickly here, an egg in a box that is hidden under a mountain. That sounds like it would stink. <laughs> Maybe that's how they find it because they're just following their nose. They get the hounds involved and they get under the mountain. Sounds which, like the they way, need a candle for a son of a pine tree. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many theories about this box and how it is it is going to show up in our Akatar story, especially with the direct ties that this Slavic tale has in Akatar. Especially because Elaine has already seen a black box in her seer visions. So this could be hidden under a mountain, which, hmm, under a mountain. What do we not know that's under a mountain? Under the Ramiel Mountain. We have no idea what's under there, but I'm going to save all of that for a future Akasif episode before I just absolutely lose my mind. The, the Koshe in Akatar is a powerful sorcerer who delights in imprisoning women. Delightful. His other name goes by Koshe the Deathless. Koshe is confined to a lake on the continent because of an ancient spell. Quote, he was outsmarted once. Everything he does is to free himself. Who was he outsmarted by? Ah, an ancient fae female warrior. This is the same ancient female warrior who bound the weaver to the middle. And the same female warrior whose bloodline runs through some human line. Cough, cough, Archeron, cough, cough. But when Cassian asks why was he imprisoned, Vasa says, quote, the story is too long to tell. I don't know, Vasa. That feels pretty important. I feel like that would be good info to know. This 100% feels like set up for Coach J being our next big bad villain. And we're going to learn so much more about him in Akotar 6. I guarantee you it has to do something with under the Ramiel mountain. I 100% agree. Vasa claims Koste would know of what might give Briallen an edge against her enemies. In other words, the crown, although we're not talking about that here on the page yet. So we can assume Koste knew where the Dread Trove crown was and had Briallen get it. Now, Briallen is using it for her own goals, but I think Koste is using her to collect the Dread Trove for himself, which is powerful enough to free him from the lake. Yes. If his sole mission is to free himself, then why else would he help someone in possession of one of the world's most powerful objects? Later, our characters will think that they're actually allies versus him pulling her strings. I don't know, though. I'm not convinced of that. And I'll say this. I think he is playing chess while Briallen is playing checkers. Upon hearing Briallen's name, though, Cassian immediately goes on mated male high alert. This is the same queen who was turned into an old crone because the cauldron was mad that Nesta took something from it, which makes this queen Nesta Archeron's number one hater. And Briallen has not been quiet about wanting to seek her revenge. 
immediately Cassian goes right back into that warrior mode mindset. He is not in courtier mindset anymore. But of course, with a mating bond twist, in his mind, he starts talking about all the ways he's going to kill Rhiannon. I love that Lucian, a fellow maiden male in the room, is the one who immediately senses Cassian's billowing beast, I'll call it, because he knows that feeling as well, too. After a day of being furious at Nesta, this one reaction from him shows just how surface level his anger really is. On a soul deep level, he would do anything to protect her. Cassian begins to calm down, rolling his shoulders and stretching out his wings to shake the feeling. But uh uh-oh, he puts his courtier hat back on and realizes well, fuck, I just showed my number one weakness. And in the game of courtiership, that is a big no-no, which Ares will use to his advantage shortly as he threatens Cassian. But like we all, including our POV characters, wonder, like we did in Akawar, why is Ares going behind his father's back to this extent with all of this? Ares already despises his father, but To move to the side with Briallen only skyrocketed that hatred higher. Quote, this unholy alliance he struck with Briallen will only hurt us, all of us. It will turn into a fey war for control. Eris is a dreamer who believes in a better world. He was just born into a place that is very much not in the same line of thinking. Baron is focused on power, power, and more power which he tries to gain through leveraging his sons, his wife, and his court, and I'll even argue now, Prithian real estate. Eris has had his own mask on with his father and family for years, but he genuinely wants to stop another all-out war, and he knows his father is most likely going to be the spark that will become this war flame, which is interesting because I did not get this vibe from Baron in the original trilogy. Baron was deemed someone who, if the others would band together, he would most likely follow suit. However, he's always wanting to be on the winning side. So I guess here he sees that winning side be with Briallen and Eris hates it. He knows the time is coming where he will need to overthrow his father and it's going to be coming soon. And let's just say he doesn't have a whole lot of remorse around it. I got to say, I know Eris is like, the night court can't come and just kill my father because it'll expose me as a traitor. Who cares? <laughs> I don't care if the night court looks sketchy. If Eris is going to be high lord after, why would it matter? At this point, my vote is assassinate Baron and stop a war. Go figure. <laughs> Phew. All right. That was all just a lot of information. You all still with us? Because this was a hard chapter to dissect here. Let's zoom out for what we readers can gather from this info dump of a scene. Baron pledged his forces to Briallen because he is ready to go to war for more control, power, and territory. This makes Eris work behind his father's back even more than he already was in Akawar. Briallen is already in possession of the crown, which controls people's minds. She is wielding the crown on Eris's soldiers and now has taken them for herself to do her bidding. She is backed by the immortal death god Koshje, who is helping her gain more power, but his ultimate goal is to get the dread trove and free himself from the lake to become master master of this world already in unrest. Eris is determined to know what Cassian knows and learns, with his mission being to uncover more about this approaching war and Briallen. Eris gave some information to Vasa and Durian, but realized they don't know much, so now he's cornering Cassian to get more information. Oh, and if Cassian and the Night Court don't play nice with him, he'll go to other courts and help them remember that if they want Briallen's alliance, all they need is Nesta. Plus, Baron has apparently already thought of that, so I'm guessing Eris has been stopping his father from stealing Nesta right now to give to Briallen. So basically, if Cassian and the Night Court don't tell Eris everything they know, he'll ensure Nesta goes to Briallen, and that'll result in a war that wipes the Night Court off the map. Come on, Eris, we were just talking about how you're a good guy deep down. (laughs) Talk about an interesting first day of this promotion for Cassian. The Night Court has some really interesting day ones on the job. I'll just, I just gotta say. I, we, we just zoomed out. I want to zoom really, really micro now because I love the writing in this scene. You can feel every moment of Cassian second guessing himself as a new courtier, or at least having to really think hard about what he's doing, saying, showing, etc. On the battlefield, you're not hiding your rage or you're second guessing your moves. You pick an enemy and you fight. When Cassian is leading the Illyrians, he's direct with them. Quote, he laid out the hell that would be brought down upon them if they rebelled and shown up to help with whatever they needed. Cassian is having to think everything through 
twice in the scene, consistently asking what would Moore or Reese do if they were here? And you're having to do all of these calculations while holding conversations and keeping your web straight. Who knows what? Who might be lying? Have you told any lies? You got to keep those straight too. So it's only fair that Cassian's head hurts. Mine would too. And keeping all that straight in his head causes several slip ups. When he goes back to his old method of speaking his mind, like for instance, when it's brought up that Eris' soldiers might have been taken by the humans, Cassian says, quote, you believe a group of humans could kill your soldiers? They can't be that skilled then. Oh, and he said this right in front of the humans, Jurian and Vasa, whose faces go dark. Whoops. Understandably, this feeling of not being a good enough courtier fuels Cassian's struggles of self-worth. He thinks he's just a brute with a blade, not someone who can play the political game. And Eris boosts this feeling by literally telling him so. When Cassian was told by Reese that his mission was to see what the human queens are up to, getting tangled up in the alliance with Eris was not on his bingo card. In fact, Reese will be telling Cassian soon to pivot and work directly with Eris, while Azriel will now monitor Brialin. So now poor Poor Cass will be fighting his insecurities from all angles. He's got Nesta trying to insult him and bring him down a few pegs to make him feel like he's not worthwhile to her, and Eris, who's pointing out his lack of courtier skill and making him feel inadequate as a political player. We cut back to Nesta, who, you'll remember, is on a wine hunt. And where will she go, knowing the smart house Pat will not give her what she seeks? To those ominous... 10,000 steps. Yanking open the door, she starts going down, 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 around and around and around. Nesta is driven. She is angry. She wants to take back this control. But she's high fae now, so she can totally do this, right? Right? Wrong! She makes it to stair 111 before saying, nope, I cannot do this anymore. Which props for her for counting, unless there's like markers on the stairs. I have always wondered if there's markers. Like there has to be, right? I have in my head that Azriel, you know, when they were younger and they had to go up and down the stairs, he was the smart one who made markers. And so that they didn't have to keep counting all the time. <laughs> That is the most anal type A shit ever. And I love Azrael even more if that that's headcanon to me. That's so good. Yeah. That. Like I could also see Reese doing that too. Like definitely not Cassie. And he'd be no. like, oh, you lazy fucks. Like we got to count this. Come on now. Oh my God. <laughs> I see Azrael. I definitely see that being some Because he's all sneaky and he'd yes. be doing it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he'd have his shadows do it. He would, he would have oh, his exactly. shadows be like a thousand steps ahead of him. And like it, he would multitask down it. It'd be brilliant. <laughs> and he wouldn't tell the others to his <laughs> oh <my laughs> Now, speaking of things we've wondered, I have always wondered about how far these 10,000 steps actually are. Because if you Google how far is 10,000 steps, it only gives you the flat ground, which is about four to five miles. But friends, these are stairs. So I went back to high school algebra with a squared plus b squared equals c squared. The average height of a stair is seven inches, which would be a in this equation. The average stair depth is nine, which would be B in this equation. So using A squared plus B squared equals C squared to figure out what the slope is from step to step, the slope would be 11.402 inches. For reference, an average step on flat ground, however, is 2.5 feet. Hold so, on, that does not seem right there. 2.5 feet for yeah, one step? Yeah, yeah. That's average, Lexi. We're short. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, that's a lot. Like, that's a big step. <laughs> Keep in mind, ours are probably not that far. So, in this scenario, 10,000 steps on a staircase is actually, oh God, where'd you go? <laughs> I'm taking a step right now. This is 2.5 feet. I don't know. I think it's more like a foot and a half or two feet, but I'm also Again, in my little desk area. <laughs> <laughs> like, imagine you're walking like mom on a flat surface. She takes 2.5 feet. Steps. Yeah. I'll tell you what, the hardest walk I've ever done is when I was super duper pregnant, like nine and a half months pregnant and trying to keep up with mom. And it's like, <laughs> I can't do this. <laughs> the irony is that mom's shorter than both of us. <laughs> And she can outwalk us any day. <laughs> anyway, so back to our 10,000 steps. That is 114,020 inches or 1.799558080. 
miles. I'm going to say that's 1.8 miles. Nesta did not make it to 10,000 steps though. This time she made it to step 111. So that is just shy of 0.2 miles on the stairs one way. So she did technically 0.4 miles on a staircase. Welcome to math. That was math class with Nicole. You're welcome. (laughs) These stairs are going to be a running theme throughout this book and apparently a running joke for us on this podcast because of what they represent for Nesta in her own healing journey. Right now, the stairs represent Nesta feeling weakness in her own body. When she's been numbing out and drinking herself void every night, she hasn't noticed how much muscle and weight she's lost. So right now, these stairs are that wake-up call, I'll say. Everything from the scene is described as around and around and down and down. It's this spiraling down language to represent the spiraling down Nesta has been doing for over a year. As she's noticing the weakness in her own body, her mind starts to wander to other moments in her life where she also felt weak and defenseless, like when she begged the King of Highburn for her father's life, stacking those negative emotions one on top of the other. But finally, the weight of it is too much. And on stair 111.2 miles down her staircase, she turns around and heads back up the stairs. That's where I have trouble with this because 0.2 miles, that's like the walk from Reese's mother's house in Windhaven to Emery's shop. They're stairs. They're, I, how about this? You come over to my apartment complex. We're going to go to the stairs, the stair steppers that are side by side. And let's see how many stairs you and I can make it up. <laughs> no, like we really do need to do that. Yes. No, like, I'm so down. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> Once when she reaches the top of the stairs again, who does Nesta run into but Cassian? I love how gleeful he is about this after a really tough day. She's proving his point about the necessity to train. And yes, he leverages her weakness to poke fun at her. She doesn't want to be this weak. She wants to make it down those 10,000 stairs to get some wine, then train and participate. Hmm. I think we're now at Cassian 2, Nesta 1. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, cool. But I appreciate how he weaves in some humor here too, easing the tension when they initially come face to face again after he needed some space from her. He starts by telling her a story about how the Bat Boys once puked up and down the stairs at the height of summer, which uh, I just love these little glimpses into their younger years. And even though he is making fun of her for how weak she is, he's also sharing a relatable moment about how they have also had difficulty on those stairs too. That is just why Cassian is so emotionally intelligent. He sees these moments of vulnerability. Nesta crawling back up the stairs is not her finest moment. And so he's like, let me even the playing field by saying, hey, here's a moment where it was not my finest moment either. It's so that she doesn't feel like she's such a failure sitting in front of him. I just, ah, it's so smart. And at the same time, he is still using that failure to try to help motivate her to do something about it. Cassian, I love you. I cannot believe he is not one of your top five book boyfriends. I I get it more for me. But my goodness, like he is my number one. (laughs) He he would be like my top five book best friends. Like for me, I think that with his personality, he is so someone who I would just be like buds with that. So it's not to say that I don't like him by any means. I love Cassian. But when I think of Cassian, I always think of him in more of like that. Oh, man, I just want to like hang out with you rather than I want to put my hands on the headboard with you. You know what I mean? (laughs) (laughs) I do indeed know what you mean. (laughs) The next day, post stairwalk, Nesta is sore. Her legs are stiff and throbbing. Yeah. Everything from putting on her own pants, going to the bathroom. I love this side note. You know, when you're like super, super sore, like my first day after Orange Theory, I had to lower myself to the toilet and raise myself back up because it hurts so bad. That's exactly what I picture here. Everything takes her double the time to get to breakfast. And thank goodness she got up early. Yet another clue for us that things are starting to turn in the right direction. She's not sleeping in really late anymore. She actually even got up early so that she could get to breakfast first. Sure, it was so that she could win the game, but it's a start. (laughs) We're going to see a stark difference in how she treats this sore morning to the one after she finally does train. Both mornings, she is kicking herself for being this sore from only a little bit of exercise. But this first morning, she's trying to hide it and she's embarrassed. She shouldn't be sore after 100 steps and she didn't even train properly to quote unquote earn this soreness. But even though she arrived to breakfast early and she's sitting down, Cassian walks in, takes one look at her 
and smirks, knowing just how much her body is hurting, both a testament to his ability to read others' body language as a warrior, but also a little mating bond hint for us readers. Nesta may be wearing fighting leathers for training or, for right now, sitting on a rock, but personally, leather does not sound very comfortable to train. You know what does, though? Quince's active wear. I am obsessed with my Quince leggings and tank tops for my runs or even just sitting at my desk. I'm even wearing my Quince leggings right now for our recording. They're just so comfortable no matter what I'm doing. In addition to their active wear, Quince is known for their Mongolian cashmere sweaters starting from $50. But that's not all. Quince's items are priced 50 to 80% less than similar brands. That includes beautiful leather jackets, cotton cardigans, soft denim, and so much more. How are they able to do that, you ask? By partnering directly with top factories and cutting out the cost of the middleman, which passes the savings on to us. And Quince only works with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices. And of course, premium fabrics and finishes for that luxury feel in every piece. Like I was saying, I love their leggings. I also love their tank tops, especially for active wear. But also, I don't get dressed up very often, but like Nicole was saying, they have fantastic sweaters where I put them on and I feel comfortable, but I look fancy and it's really nice. <laughs> I have my favorite pair of shorts from Quince and they're like, they're the shorts that you can like dress up or dress down. They're like, they're black, they're pleated. I can wear them with leggings underneath for the fall season. I love it. Get cozy in Quince's high quality wardrobe essentials. Go to quince.com slash FFG for free shipping on your orders and 365 day returns. That's Q U. U-I-N-C-E dot com slash F-F-G to get free shipping and 365 day returns. Quince dot com slash F-F-G. All right. So friends, we are in the dining room and who else is here but Asriel. One of my favorite things about this book is that we get a few scenes with Asriel where he just talks so much more than he does when he's around the entire inner circle. He's a quiet conversationalist in the scene, but he's asking Nesta about how training is going and telling her he really hopes she isn't giving Cassie and his brother a hard time, which I'm going to assume Reese told Asriel how training was going unless Asriel's just been so busy that he didn't get the update. Oh, he definitely knows. And he's just asking Nesta for her opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Which I kind of love, though, because he's instead of just passing judgment on her, he's saying, hey, I'm also reaching out my hand in addition to Cassian, just in a different way. It's notable that Nesta is surface level nicer to Asriel than she is to Cassian, which is absolutely on purpose as she rubs in Cassian's face and gets under his skin that she prefers Asriel, what with his pretty face and wanting to train with him instead. I will add, though, even if there is that threat language with Asriel, but, you know, the bar is currently very low for Nesta and what is deemed nice for her. <laughs> yes, that's true. Nesta is testing Cassian, trying to learn more and more ways to get under his skin. She thinks, quote, she could have sworn Cassian went still. Interesting. That interesting is her gathering data on what makes Cassian tick. Part of her is wanting to make Cassian jealous. However, it's not any jealous that like, oh, Asriel might go for it with Nesta because he wouldn't. It's Asriel. But it's more jealous that she wants to spend time with others who aren't Cassian. Poor Azriel is caught in the middle of Cassie and Anessa's games with each other as he's both mortified and can barely hold in his laughter at these two. Honestly, same as. Once again, Nesta tries to embarrass Cassian with her quip, I bet that isn't what you've been telling yourself at night. But Cassian knows how to dish it right back. And so does she. As has a front row seat to a tennis match talking about Cassian's masturbation habits. <laughs> Never thought I'd say that. <laughs> no wonder he'll be like, oh my God, dude, you're in such deep shit as he can smell Cassian's boner. Azrael, we need a chaperone for these horny teenagers. So here's my question for you, Nicole. Does anyone win this round? Because I feel like it's a draw, even though Nesta gets the final say. Uh, I was actually going to say Cassian wins this round, I feel like, but... No, I think, so horny. I, think draw. <laughs> I think I think it's a draw. Because... <laughs> I, th I think both win this round. So should we give both of them a point or should we just? No, just neither of them get a point <laughs> for this one. <laughs> All right. So as it stands, we are still at Cassian two, Nesta one. Day two of training, though, it's bound to be better, right? Nope. Despite Cassian hoping otherwise, yet again, Nesta sits her ass down on that rock, not a boulder, and refuses to get up for training. But this time, Cassian is not going to play her game. After a fine, fine, fine off, he throws a mocking grin and a 
good one, Ness. Something he knows will make her see red. Unlike yesterday when Nessa knew she was in control and trying to drive him to rage, winning her a reluctant point from the two of us. This time he's telling her, yeah, that little trick, it did not work on me. Watch me toss it right back to you today. So with that last word, he falls into the steady place within his mind and lets his body start his exercises that he's performed for more than five centuries. This is a hard one because even though Cassian is taking it like a champ, Nesta still is not training. So she gets the point here because it's really, still, yeah. I so, think Cassian gets the point here, but it still really gets under his skin because the next day he is going to still have his outburst because she is not training and she is still beating him at this game here, even though he's trying everything he can. Ah, okay. I, yep. Okay. Cassian two, Nesta two. After an hour, Cassian is breathless and sweaty. Calm down, Lexi. And Nesta is free. <laughs> Jake, Jake, where are you? Your woman. <laughs> and Nesta is freezing. So because Cassian has some business to attend to, he tells her that she can go to Reese's mother's house to warm up. I love this little detail we get about being in Cassian's first ever home. And it's filled with so many scratches and burn marks, all holding a memory from him and Reese brawling to the stain on the couch where Cassian spilled ale and too drunk to clean it up properly. They were caught by <laughs> Reese's mother. It was also a giveaway that Azriel could not stop hiccuping, which is just a perfect little detail. One of the reasons I love getting other POVs in this book is because we get so much more insight into their own little bat boy shenanigans. I love it. I can't wait for Azriel's POV because what on earth are we going to get from him? <laughs> like, I'm so excited. Nesta, though, spies a fire with popping logs in the corner, and it causes her face to blanch and shadows to creep across her face. It's moments like this why Cassian knows there is so much more to the story with Nesta. He sees these moments where she disappears into her own horrors and knows they are what cause her cruelty she shows to everyone. So knowing her, he offers her another option. If you don't like being here, head out to the shops and go visit the village. I love that he offers her a choice. He's not saying go to the village, but instead he's saying, hey, here's a lifeline if you want it. Crazy how little choices, like in this case, walking into a shop can lead to significant changes in life, right? Nesta wanders into a shop and meets one of her future best friends, Emery. And ah, I love how they meet when she is still refusing to train, but it's also not her very first day. I'll also love that she meets Gwen on the exact same day, but we'll get to that soon. Nesta still has her walls up, especially here at Windhaven, and yet she'll find instant camaraderie with Emery, which is absolutely unheard of for Nesta. Nesta knows this female is someone she might be able to get along with because Emery calls the Illyrians, quote, proud fools. And when Nesta admits that she's cut off from the inner circle, Emery still offers to make inquiries about getting Nesta warmer leathers, quote, no matter what the High Lord may think. Emery isn't immediately siding with Reese in the inner circle here saying, oh, well, what did you do to get cut off? Like, oh, then I can't even help you. Like, da, 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 da. Nesta is used to people believing that the inner circle are basically gods and definitely siding with them and thus against Nesta. But here Emery is saying, eh, there's probably two sides to the story, which is something Nesta's not used to. Exactly. She's so used to assuming everyone around her is judging her and thinking the worst. And it almost throws her off where she can just be a normal person here. When Emery admits that she knows of Nesta Archeron, she knows who she is, she says it's because, quote, you killed the King of Highburn, not because you're the High Lady's sister, because you work for the Inner Circle. Emery is such a special friend because she views Nesta as her own person right off the bat, rather than what Nesta has been known as, aka an extension of Feyre, which is one of the reasons Nesta doesn't feel like she has her own home here. But it does make me wonder, when was the last time Nesta had a normal conversation like this, where she had the notion of, hmm, I could actually like this person? Was it Claire better? Never forget you, Claire. R.I.P. I bet you smell better now that you're in the dirt. <laughs> like, I, I really wonder if it's not since poverty or even before. I've wondered that too. I like to think she's had a pleasant conversation with a musician or two, but at the same time, she saw the musicians when she was visiting the taverns and she was definitely drinking. So yeah. I don't know about that. But like, it's been years 
no matter what, like when some like sober conversation like this, it's been more than years. Yes. Emery is described as, quote, her angular eyes and light brown skin suggested heritage from another region, perhaps a recent ancestor from the Dawn Court, which I missed this detail on all my previous reads. Was Emery's mother's family from the Dawn Court? Because we don't really know a whole lot about her mother. Well, her mother has to be Illyrian because of the bat wings. Yes. So I don't know how that would work. And of course, also the winged species of the Dawn Court, they do have different wombs because we'll learn all that later. So her mother would have to be Illyrian. The Illyrians were bred to be warriors by the Daglin. So it's entirely possible that she is three quarters Illyrian and maybe one of her grandfathers was from the Dawn Court or maybe even a relative from the continent territory, Xi'an, and they fled after the war. Then instead of going to the Dawn Court like most others, they went to Illyria. Well, later at the Blood Rite, we will learn Emery's full backstory. She gives us a little taste of it now. Her father was a traditional Illyrian asshole who believed that Illyrian females should serve families and be confined to their home. Sadly. Literally. Lit- fucking ass. But despite Emery's protests, her father won that fight and clipped her wings. Clipping happens after an Illyrian female gets her first period, where they make an incision between her wings, which impacts the key muscles and renders renders her unable to fly. It's an old Illyrian tradition, and now even though it's illegal, it takes a long time for change to take root with the Illyrian bastards. Emery was clipped during Amarantha's reign when this illegal act commonly slipped through the cracks, like many other things without Reese to dish out consequences. Emery says that no one but the High Lord of Dawn himself would be able to heal her wings because of how complex it is. And Nesta thinks to herself that her sister Feyre has these same healing powers. I don't think Thera is as skilled at her healing power to do something this complicated, but if slash when she hones this skill, could she maybe heal Emery's wings later in the series? Would Emery even want them healed at this point after so long without flying and having to relearn? I am so team this is an Easter egg for a future book. And here's my few crack theories. What if Thyssen or Feyre heals Emery's wings and then she gets to learn how to fly? And what if Feyre, if she is the one who heals her, what if she's also the one to teach her how to fly because Feyre learned how to fly so late? Which I would just weep. I would weep. That's so beautiful. These two see a lot of each other's steel and stubbornness in one another, but they also share a deep bond through their trauma. They have very different pasts, but Nessa sees a female who had control of her body taken away from her too, by her father, who one is supposed to love and trust. And Emery doesn't let it phase her, at least on the surface, anymore. She pushes through and takes ownership of the shop. She keeps herself busy and holds her head high as she perseveres through life. I think Nesta looks up to Emery in that way. Way because Nessa's trauma has been swallowing her whole and she can't push forward yet. Emery still has a long ways to go on her own healing journey, which the Valkyrie training will absolutely help her with. But it's like she's that friend who's a few steps ahead of you, not miles ahead like we might consider Thera at this point, who you could say is on the other side with her happily ever after, but a little ahead where it feels tangible to get to that point too. I never thought about that. I love that parallel. Yes. Field trip is over though because it's back to the library. After a pissed Cassian and more drop off Nesta, practically dumping Nesta off on the veranda, Nesta goes to get her assignment from Clotho, which includes being on level five. Remember, there are seven descending levels to the library, which at first unnerves Nesta, knowing Bryaxis, a living shadow nightmare that even Cassian can't talk about, used to live down there and is now just roaming out in the world. But that's for a future book. As Clotho says, though, Bryaxis never harmed any of them because they saw their nightmares come true before their own eyes. Nesta is very similar. And I would also argue that's probably why Bryaxis never hurt Feyre because she saw her own nightmares come before her eyes. And while yes, Bryaxis is gone, the center pit of the library still has a dark quality to it, which Nesta will come to learn on winter solstice is the heart of the house. This is who Smart House Pat is deep down, showing Nesta that it's just the same as her. I have more theories about what this darkness signifies, but I will wait until we get to that part of the deep dive. Ooh, mystery. (laughs) As Nesta is talking to Smart House Pat, she hears a light female voice ask, who are you talking to? Welcome to the chat, Gwyneth. Gwen has rich red brown hair, large teal eyes, which are both clear and depthless and scattering freckles. Plus, she has slender, elegant limbs, which we will later learn is because she is a quarter water nymph where her twin sister got the webbed hands. 
Gwen got the slender limbs and large eyes. There's a line upon first meeting Gwen that inspires some theories as well. And it is, quote, a crackling sort of energy buzzed around her and Nesta's power grumbled in answer. We'll discuss who Gwen's father might be later on. But for instance, this crackling energy could be the fire magic of the Autumn Court, which we know her grandsire is from. It's not quite the same description as fire power we've seen on the page, but hey, you never know. Another theory is that Gwen is part light singer, which refers more to her character and singing. But don't worry, I will do a full theory talk about all this later because it's actually a really cool theory. Light singers are lovely ethereal beings that lure you, appearing as friendly faces when you are lost. Only when you're in their arms will you see their true faces and they aren't there at all. While this has no reference to crackling energy magic, maybe it's a nod to the light part of the name light singer. Anyway, just mentioning all of this right now, but we have a long way to go with Gwen to dive more into her lineage theories. And despite being a priestess and wearing the traditional acolyte robes, she doesn't have her hood pulled up and her invoking stone on her forehead like the others. Later, Gwen will admit that she feels unworthy of donning the stone after what happened in Sangreva when Hybern attacked and it resulted in her twin sister, Katrin, being beheaded. But we'll get more into that at a later date. She introduces herself as Gwyneth Berdara. The name Gwyneth means happiness. However, the name Gwen means white, fair, or blessed. Sounds very similar to light, like a light singer. Ah! But the name Bardara means bleeding or bloody, which goes right back to what you're saying, Lexi, with the light singer, how she appears like this happiness, this lightness, but Bardara having that bloodiness, that bleeding on the inside. I love it. But also this is just so on par with Gwen's character. She appears to be this lovely, lovely, happy person, when in actuality, she has a very dark past, again, that we will get into later. Now, the fact that Gwen introduces herself with her last name surprises Nesta, since Faye tend to not use last names. Quote, even Reese didn't use one as far as Nesta knew. This feels like such a pointed line, and I'm not the only one who thinks so. There is a very popular theory that Reese's last name is Darling, and he would always call Feyre, Feyre Darling, as a wink, wink, hint, hint, you're going to be my wife someday. However, I can't get on board with this theory because A, how Amarantha, you would also call her Darling, and B, how there's a comma between Feyre and Darling. And I feel like if it was on purpose, it would have been Feyre Darling, both capitalized, no comma in between. However, we were also in Feyre's POV, so that could be an unreliable narrator moment. Like I was saying during our first Emery encounter, I absolutely love how Nesta meets these two on the same day. They will become Nesta's found family that she chooses. They will be like sisters exactly who each other needs at this point in their individual journeys. Gwen is the softest of the three, but don't let her gentle nature fool you because she is just as stubborn as Nesta and Emery. Ah, I can't wait to get into their beautiful friendship throughout this deep dive. But that's jumping ahead of ourselves because right now at this first introduction with Gwen, it's notable that she's not scared of Nesta. Like Emery, she doesn't judge Nesta as the terrible person Nesta thinks everyone views her as. Nesta thinks Gwen is judging her as lazy at first, when indeed Gwen is I'll call it innocently observant with her, you've only been working for an hour. That's when Nesta becomes rude. She tells herself it's because she already met her basic decency quota for the day from her friendly conversation with Emery, which by the way, like, If that doesn't say Nesta right there, I don't know what does. But really, she's once again turning that self-consciousness of being judged into anger. It doesn't ruffle sweet Gwen's feathers, though. In fact, when Nesta speaks to her like she normally does to people at Gwen's request, Gwen actually smiles and is like, oh, you're good, which Nesta genuinely doesn't know what to make of. No one answers her like that. Not even Cassian, who pushes right back at her and plays the game, versus Gwen, who simply accepts Nesta and like kind of like laughs. I don't want to say at her, but it's like, oh, interesting. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, this is absolutely within Gwen's nature, but I also believe the sense of acceptance and approachability ties back to Nesta being in the sanctuary like the priestesses, here to heal from her trauma, even if she doesn't see it as such yet. Gwen does not pass judgment on her fellows and instead shows grace and empathy, which is something Nesta, without knowing it, desperately needs in a friend. Both of them, and certainly Emery too, carry their own baggage. They don't try to be tough for each other or dump their troubles onto each other. This book is about these three friends' journey finding strength in each other and in themselves. Their trauma isn't something to judge or take pity on. It's something to accept and push forward despite. 
While Emery's trauma is partly represented by her physical scars and her wings, Gwen's trauma is invisible. And Nessa recognizes that within her, knowing as a priestess that she endured terrible horrors like Nessa herself. This realization that maybe Gwen is more like her than she initially thinks takes that sharpness out of her tone. And I love how Gwen pushes back being like, no, treat me like a normal person, which is all Nessa subconsciously wants for herself too, to be treated like a normal person, despite how she pushes people like Cassie in a way to prevent such a thing from happening. I mean, shoot, she even kind of tries to push Gwen away when she tells on her to Clotho. But our favorite high priestess is the one to remind Nesta that some may think she's also a piece of work and Gwen has been through a lot like Nesta. Quote, acid that felt a lot like regret burned in Nesta's veins. I love these descriptions we get of uncomfortable and vulnerable emotions like shame and regret. They are physically painful for Nesta, and she tries not to acknowledge them for the emotions that they are. In this case, it's like, oh, this feels like regret, but she's not owning that it does feel like that. You know what Cassian would love? The world's first handheld metabolic coach, Lumen. It's a device that measures your metabolism through your breath. And on the app, it lets you know if you're burning fat or carbs, and it gives you tailored guidance to improve your nutrition, your workouts, your sleep, or even stress management. All you have to do is breathe into your Lumen first thing in the morning, and you'll know what's going on with your metabolism, whether you're burning mostly fats or carbs. Then Lumen gives you a personalized nutrition plan for the day based on your measurements. You can also breathe into it before and after workouts and meals so you know exactly what's going on with your body in real time. And Lumen will give you tips to keep you on top of your health game. Your metabolism is your body's engine. It's how your body turns the food that you eat into fuel that keeps you going. Because your metabolism is at the center of everything your body does, optimal metabolic health translates to a bunch of benefits, including easier weight management, improved energy levels, better fitness results, better sleep. And with Lumen, you're given the information and recommendations to improve your metabolic health. Also, shout out to the Lumen app. It is absolutely fantastic. I love a really good, user-friendly, beautiful app, and Lumen is all of that. So if you want to take the next step in improving your health, go to lumen.me slash FFG to get 15% off your Lumen. That is L-U-M-E-N dot me slash FFG for 15% off your purchase. Thank you, Lumen, for sponsoring this episode. A character that we're going to get to know very well starts to show itself on the page more and more in this stretch of chapters. From not giving her wine to offering her food and double chocolate cake, Zayden Ryerson would be so happy, and always dropping off the latest romance book for Nesta, even keeping her bed warm. Yes, I am talking about Smart House Pat. After day two in the library is when Nesta really begins to soften to the house. Curled up in the house's private library, eating her double chocolate cake, Nesta begins to talk to the house, even thanking it, saying please for the food that it sends her. Not manners we're usually used to seeing from Nesta. Now you might be asking, the house is not a new addition to the story, but its characterization of Smart House is definitely new. Later at Starfall, Airman will tell Nesta that she made the house. Quote, your power brought the house to life with a silent wish born from loneliness and desperate need. Oh. We'll learn later in this book that because Nesta took raw power from the cauldron, she has the ability to make objects. And that is with a capital M, make. She can pour power into these objects and make them come alive as she needs them to. The made weapons will be the most powerful weapons this world has seen in 10,000 years. And her friendship bracelets with the charms will guide the three best friends to each other again. But the first thing she makes without even realizing it is the House of Wind. Recall back at the end of chapter three when Nesta curled up in bed and breathed and breathed and breathed. It wasn't stated on the page, but we find out at Starfall that in her loneliness and desperation, she wished for a friend. And so the house came alive as that friend for her. Yes, the house has darkness, and we'll explore what the hell that means when Nesta visits the library pit where the house's heart is. But for now, it's important to acknowledge that in the context of Nesta's story, darkness will always remain, but how we choose to face it and rise above it is what matters because without darkness, there cannot be light. This sums Nesta up perfectly and the house represents that her power mirrors this concept of darkness and light. There's a theory that Maddie from Bardic Book Club shared with me at at a ball earlier this year, which by the way, I've been waiting months since May (laughs) to talk about this. (laughs) And also I don't have the most details on it because I was several glasses of wine deep, so I apologize. (laughs) 
It's that the house is the spirit of Reese's sister, <gasps> who embodies both the darkness of the night court and within ourselves, but still shines with love and support. And even though this is not her necessarily coming back to life, it's like her soul and her spirit is now represented here. A huge shout out to Maddie and Connor of Bardic Book Club. We love you guys. We love you so much. (laughs) In summary, the house already had basic magic to make food appear or clean or make your bed warm, all that kind of stuff. But when Nesta deep down wished for a friend, she gave it a soul with feelings and sentiment. That's why this version of the house surprises Cassian. It's a new development. I also wonder if this new character edition was because SJM, she was dealing with very similar emotions when writing this book. I wonder if she needed a friend and this new character was almost her wish and what she desperately needed. Yes, so much so. And it is just such a great symbol that Nesta can have friendship. Even before she truly becomes friends with Emery and Gwen, she is capable of appreciating this friendship. You know, she feels so lonely so often And yet she loves when the house keeps her company in whatever way that it does. It's so sweet also how proud Nesta is that the house likes her when she's talking to Cassian. Because the truth is, not many people do like her. He finds her in the library. And I just got to say, I love how he takes her chocolate cake. By the way, you mentioned this too. What is it with the main male characters and chocolate cake in romantic books? It feels like a metaphor for their decadent deliciousness. <laughs> and that's coming from someone who doesn't like chocolate. <laughs> I don't like chocolate cake. Nope. <laughs> chocolate cake and chocolate ice cream. Nope. Although I do love flourless chocolate cake. Cassian is being pretty brilliant here as he takes Nesta's cake and begins to eat it while she protests. He tells her the reasons why training would make sense in a way that speaks to her. Quote, your threats would be a hell of a lot more impressive if you could back them up. He's also saying like, I could train you how to use a fork as a weapon if you wanted. He's trying to remind her that there is a reason behind this, aka There's a reason why this is not a punishment, but instead this is for you. It might not always seem like it, but Nesta is someone who needs logic and reason. She's a rebel slash questioner from Gretchen Rubin's Four Tendencies. I can't decide if she's a rebel or a questioner. It's definitely an overlapping of the two. Anyway, she needs to know why she should do anything anything. And Cassian is laying it out, much like he did after she crawled up the stairs to face him the other night. He's like, you can do this. Yes. Do it. This is why. Later in the middle of the night, Nesta wakes up from a dream of Elaine being stolen by the cauldron and her father's neck getting snapped. Jolting awake, something in her gut, quote, writhed and twined around itself, seeking a way out. As we discussed last episode, one of the reasons Nesta drinks, meaninglessly has one night stands and gambles is because she fears this power inside of her. And as it rolls up trying to seek a way into the world, her old coping methods are not an option. She attempts to shove it down. And while it obeys, it still grumbles through her. So she reaches for her tried and true option, drinking. Only 10,000 steps between her and that sweet oblivion. I know I said a minute ago about how Nesta needs logic and reason, but maybe I should have clarified not if her emotions, her power, and her coping mechanisms are front and center, which is now. It doesn't matter that it's in the middle of the night, which we'll learn later that it's 3 a.m., or that she spectacularly failed going down the stairs the other evening. She's got tunnel vision. I need a drink now, and I know the one way to get it. These stairs are becoming an obstacle for her. She's not yet determined to overcome them, but rather she is completely focused on only the outcome, going to a tavern and drinking so she can get out of her head and numb herself to the power boiling within her. I'm so excited to see how this perspective of the stairs evolves throughout the book to where it does become much more of an obstacle that she internally needs to overcome versus focused on the outcome there. She can't run away from her trauma and power though, as much as she literally tries as she goes down, down, and down the stairs, a whopping 66 steps, right as nausea and, more importantly, her power swells, Nesta loses her footing, and she falls, falls, falls down 30 steps. Ouch is an understatement here. She'll be so bruised and beaten up after this fall that she'll realize it might have killed her if she was still human. Sparks explode out of her hands, 
not quite like that, but you know what I mean, <laughs> as she tries to stop herself and she winds up burning her handprint into the stone, quote, glowing as if lit with an inner flame. Since the war, Nesta has tried convincing herself she doesn't have powers. Her refusal to acknowledge and do anything about her powers is what spurred her falling out with Amran. And it's dangerous for this great and deadly power to have no escape within her, trapped to royal within, which is a major reason why she drinks and sleeps with strangers, to push it further down and pretend it doesn't exist. Seeing the literal evidence of her powers scares Nesta, even in something as seemingly small as a burnt handprint in the stone. Which, by the way, I just did some quick math, and this... 66 steps equates to about 62 feet, which if we're going in our mile duration, that is 0.011 miles. The next morning at Windhaven, Cassian has no time for her BS, asking right off the bat, quote, who won the fight between you and the stairs? He's doing this as he's going through his series of exercises with his sword designed to cut a person in two. I love that he's again showing her, hey, this could be you instead of falling down the stairs because it turns out he saw the whole thing and didn't come to help, which I want to quickly address because people do have some feelings about. I want to point out that Reese did the same thing with Feyre when he laid in a tree while she snuck in and out of the weaver's cottage and got caught and almost died. Cassian confirmed that she was alive and knew that if he went to help Nesta, she would not learn how to help herself. Literally the same thing Reese did for Feyre, wanting to empower her to be her own savior rather than needing a big, strong bat boy. It also reminds me of what Amran told him after the first failed day of training. Quote, let her dig her own grave, boy, then offer her a hand. I'll even bring up our conversation from episode one, where no matter what, it can feel like a lose-lose situation with Nesta. He tries to help her as she falls down the stairs and her embarrassment would be disguised as anger and Cassian would still be in the wrong. From afar, he makes sure she stops falling and survives it okay, knowing she's capable of it because she's high fae, and he's in trouble because he didn't help her in the first place. At this point, she's proving to herself that she is physically weak and needs an outlet that she is desperately seeking, but she's too bullheaded to recognize the proof she's giving herself over and over. With this being the third day of training at Windhaven, Nesta will finally get off off the rock, right? Right? No, Cassian's gotten pissed. He's toyed with her. And today he tries a different tactic. Quote, Cassian bristled, but he held out his hand again. Please. Using Amran's advice after day one, when he was at the river house telling Pharaoh Reese and Amran how he's failed. Quote, keep reaching out your hand. Goes back to last night, how she dug her own grave again when she fell down the stairs. So hey, guess what? Here's another chance to do something about your life, Nesta. For Cassie, and this will be a common theme with his relationship with Nesta, especially at the beginning. And I will say it's effective. These two have their game of power dynamics where they're tied right now. They're both at two, right? Yes. And reaching out your hand is saying, hey, I'm not going to win this round. And that's okay, because I'm willing to meet you halfway and let you win. Which quick shout out to the reaching out your hand section of the playlist, which might be my favorite section. And it makes me very emotional. And yes, you can find it in the show notes. This hand reaching out almost works this time. Nesta sees the vulnerability made more so by his pleas. Quote, she told herself to get up, to take that outreached hand but she couldn't, couldn't bring her body to rise. She wants to do this and meet him halfway, but it's that deep down real version of herself that wants to do it for him. And Cassian sees that want flash across her face and he gets hopeful, but she is so far down this rabbit hole of like, I just want to spite you, AKA actually, I want you to hate me because it's what I deserve, that no matter how badly she wants to get up for him, her strong will will not budge. It's like her heart is telling her yes, but her head is telling her no. Exa exactly. She knows that if she does take his outreached hand, that will metaphorically heal this discourse between the two of them. So as he lowers his hand after several moments, his eyes dim. Quote, she deserved his disappointment, deserved his resentment and disgust, even if it carved something vital from her. Nesta believes she deserves this anger, especially from Cassian, further proving to herself that she is unworthy of someone else's care, specifically Cassian's. But Cassian says, quote, tomorrow then, showing her that, yeah, I'm disappointed and I'm fucking pissed, but I will not give up on you. I will keep reaching out my hand. As much as I really want to give Cassian a point here because he does say tomorrow and he just keeps trying, even though later this evening it will not go as well as he's <laughs> hoping for in this moment here. Nesta does not train again, so I'm going to 
You know what? Nobody gets a point in this okay. one. I don't really feel good giving her a point right now. I, I think they both cancel out a point for each other because Cassian does get the last word with tomorrow then, which does, I'll say, unnerve Nesta. It does kind of give her like a, oh, okay, feeling, which I don't feel like that deserves a point for her. So yes, I agree. No points. It'll still tied 2-2. Yes. We are making up our own rules here. With <laughs> <round>. <laughs> <laughs> Where the points don't, what's the, whose line is it anyway? Where the points don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> don't matter. <laughs> anyway, with the house pissed at Nesta for refusing to eat her sandwich earlier and trying to stay reclusive, it pretty much forces her to go to the dining room and have dinner with Cassian and Azriel. We learn that, according to Reese, things are too dangerous on the continent for Azriel to have his spy master base there. So woohoo, new roomie, everybody. Instead, he will winnow back and forth to the continent. The conversation turns to Nesta and we see Asriel's soft-spoken manner come to light again. He is gentle with his questions about why Nesta won't train. And it reminds me of when he would ask Elaine questions and get her to open up when all else failed. Unfortunately, though, it doesn't work the same with Nesta. Shocker! Partly because, unlike her interactions with new people like Clotho or Emery or Gwyn, there is a predisposed judgment against her. At least that's what she's convinced herself of. And yeah, Cassian's over her shit with refusing to train. He said tomorrow earlier as a sign that he won't give up. But dang, it's really hard for him to keep his cool with Nesta just being Nesta. It's been three days. And after her resolve today to not get off that rock, even when he knew she wanted to, he's starting to lose hope as much as he doesn't want to. And so she starts to get even more under their skin. And what's one way to get right underneath that skin? It's saying anything negative about their brother, Reese. Yes, Nesta hates him and she's not shy about it. But Reese is everything to the inner circle. He sacrificed everything for them. So calling him, quote, a arrogant preening asshole and calling out how much she hates him, yeah, it does not go over well. Later in the book, she will even acknowledge that he is a good high lord, that he is selfless, that he is all of these things that people say, but it's his personality that she can't stand. Exactly. Now, Nesta, the reason you're bringing this up is not because you have to get this off your chest right now. It is directly to get a reaction out of Cassian. I won't even say Azrael. I think she's directly focusing this energy on Cassian and to going right back to that power dynamic to get her back on top. If he is set off and she's the one who calmly did it, she is in the position of power and control again, which woof, this is a second L for Ness. I can't believe this is only the second L. I think her- In this episode, she got an L last True. episode. And honestly, she's just consistently L. Yeah, for these first these are just when we're pointing them out. <laughs> she's allowed to hate Reese. They are oil and water at times. But her motivation here is entirely Cassian focused. You're so right about her wanting to hold on to that little bit of control. Cassian is insisting that she's been given an order and she straight up doesn't care because no one will listen to her. She won't train at that miserable village. This is the hill she is willing to die on because she will literally rather die than train in front of the Illyrians. And so this is also, I think, a cry for help being like, nobody's listening to me. And she's trying to gain that control back there. Which, what does Cassian say to her after she says she hates Reese? Quote, oh boy, good. He hates you too. Everyone fucking hates you. Is that what you want? Because congratulations, it's happened. Yikes. I love how even Asriel lets out a long, long breath. Like, bad move, bro. You played right into her hand. As much as we were just saying, he won't give up on her. He is throwing up his hands right now. He has gone to bat for her time and time again, and she keeps proving him wrong. And he's sick of her attitude. And yep, she's successfully gotten under his skin. Well, and I'll also point out, like, dish is shit back to her. Again, I am going to point out these moments where Cassian is not this perfect little lovesick puppy. Yes. He tells her right now, everyone fucking hates you. And this is a self-fulfilling prophecy for Nesta in this moment. She wanted to get this reaction out of Cassian. Congratulations, Nesta. You got it. And 
she's hurt by his words, even though she's the one who pushed him to anger. I'll also say, too, she also literally is trying to get everyone to hate her. And then when she realizes that everyone does hate her, she's really upset about it. Again, it's that lose-lose situation yes. and her needing to be in control where she's the one who needs to be the mean one. She's the one who needs to be saying, no, I don't want you. But then the moment someone else is like, well, then fine, then I don't want you. She's like, well, wait a second. What are you talking yeah. about? She needs to be in control of the reason why everyone hates her because then it proves yes. her own self-conscious right. Like, yes, this trying to get back the upper hand, quote, and now I suppose you'll tell me that you're the only person who doesn't hate me. And I'm supposed to feel something like gratitude and agree to train with you. But despite Cassian's reaching out his hand attempt earlier in the promise of tomorrow, he tells her he's done. And it, again, surprises Nesta. It's her pushing people away and then being surprised when they actually leave. It's infuriating, but it also psychologically, when you get in her shoes, it makes sense. Like, it's such a double-edged sword here. And then when she even says that, you know, like, oh, and now you'll tell me, you know, you're the only person who doesn't hate me. That's her telling that to herself. Yep. And being like, wait, you don't hate me though, right? Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. Nesta is so infuriating with these lose-lose situations that she creates for everybody, not just herself, but for most other people around her as well. And it's also just so interesting to analyze why she's doing this too, because even though we understand why she is acting this way, of course it doesn't make it okay. No. And yeah, another L for Nesta? Yeah, yes? yeah, yeah. Big okay, else. great. It's just lol. Yes, <laughs> now, does anybody get a point in these rounds too, or is this just everybody? Asriel well? gets the point. <laughs> <Asriel> gets the <laughs> point. <laughs> gets the point. <laughs> well, because meanwhile, poor Az is in the middle of all this again, and he's being quiet. He's letting the two of them hash it out. But I will say also, he's not letting her insults about Reese go unchecked with those eyes simmering with anger. But he also trusts his brother to take care of this here and to defend Reese when it's needed. And he's not letting her get under his skin in the way that she's needing that reaction from Cassian. And she wants that reaction from both of them, I'll say. He's saying, yes, I'm pissed. Yes, I'm angry. I hate the words that you're saying, but I'm going to stay calm because I'm not going to let you get under my skin here. And when he doesn't, she's She's literally like burying her teeth at him and like yes. trying to get a reaction out of him. And he's just staring at her calmly and coolly and collected. And she gets up and leaves. Okay. Hot take. Asriel should have been the one to train Nesta in this seat, at least at the beginning, I think, because he would have been so calm. And I love Cassie. And I'm, I'm thrilled that he's the one who trained her, obviously, for their love story and what it means and yada, yada, yada. But it would have made more sense for Asriel to be the one at least at first. After the dining room argument, Nesta goes to the library to try to keep herself busy. I love how she's only been there for a few days, but it is already becoming a welcoming space for her. Yes, the roaring silence in her head follows her there. But she needs to do something with herself, like literally do something with her hands instead of go crazy alone in her room. And she recognizes that. And so she's going to seek that out. Cassian, meanwhile, broods like Jon Snow on the mountain the House of Wind is built into, overlooking the training ring that's right there waiting to be used. I wonder what that could mean below him. He is wallowing in his failure to try and help Nesta. None of his attempts to help her. What? What? They use that training ring with Feyre. They know I, how well this works. I know. I know. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> God damn it. Calder boil me. <laughs> and also, if Azrael's doing any kind of training, even though he's super busy with everything, wouldn't it be at the House of Wind as well? Because he sure as hell is not going to Illyria war camps to train. He would rather kick and scream and like do anything but train at the Illyrian war camp again. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, <laughs> whatever. He is wallowing in his failure to try and help Nesta. None of his attempts to help her have worked, and he is at his wit's end. We've talked so much about how he has given her the benefit of the doubt and is the only one who truly sees the real Nesta beneath all the cold and cruelty. But at this point, he is ready to give up because even though he knows there's someone better underneath, he's worried that that someone is buried just too deep for him to even be able to reach. Now, I also do think that if he was able to sleep it off and cool down a little bit, he would have already been in a better mindset the next morning. So we are talking about specifically here in the moment. Feyre joins Cassian on his perch, still with that impenetrable shield around her. Someone did penetrate her, though. <laughs> We are five years old. 
Oh, Alfred. we haven't even gotten started, Lex. <laughs> After a quick catch up about Brie Allen and Koshe, the conversation, of course, turns to Nesta. When Farah asks why she won't train, Cassian answers, because she hates me. We've discussed endlessly how this is not true, and Feyre, who knows Nesta well and knows when she really does hate someone, agrees with us. Nesta is projecting her self-hatred onto Cassian, and Cassian truly does know this, but as he's caught up in feeling like he's failed, it's so hard not to take her rejection personally. She fights him on everything. She's purposefully being nice to Asriel to get a rise out of him. Her goal is literally to make him think she hates him so she can push him further away. It's not until Cassian repeats exactly what Nesta has been saying since the beginning, that she won't train in this miserable village, that it clicks. The big issue is not training itself or even with Cassian. It's where they're taking her to train for all the reasons we listed at the top of the episode. With a plan in place, he is determined to try one more time to help her and hold out his hand, which, as we'll find out next chapter, is training here at the House of Wind with no one else around to see her be vulnerable as a beginner. I really like how it's a conversation with Feyre, who truly does love her sister and want to help that prompts this idea. But it's still Cassian's idea, showing again that he's the one who ultimately knows Nesta best and knows the best way to reach her in order to help her. Yeah. All right, friends, let's turn our full attention to foreshadowing important moments in the rest of this book and bring up any other speculations for what's next in the series. I'll go first. If we called out all the Cassian and Nesta bangity bang foreshadowing, we would honestly be here all day. But he wants to worship every inch of that spectacular backside. And all I can think is, Put your hands on the headboard <laughs> where he can see that booty in his face. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, he cannot afford distractions like that. Quick shout out to the Cassian and Nesta sex section of the playlist because Lexi had two additions to this playlist and only two songs. She wanted... It's getting hot in here. Yep. To take off all your clothes. And then what was the other one? <laughs> Lick my pussy and my crack. There it is. <laughs> Which I was like, oh, <laughs> my goodness. Moving on. Cassian thinks in regards to Nesta that she would have made a fine general someday or that she might still be one. Later in chapter 41... Cassian will be shocked that Nesta makes a comment about possibly leading. Quote, you're planning on leading an army, Ness? Nesta will say, quote, not an army. She glanced sidelong at him, but perhaps a small unit of females. Yes, indeed. Vasa says, quote, I fear what may happen if Koshje ever gets free of the lake, if he sees this world on the cusp of disaster and knows he could strike and strike hard and make himself its master, as he tried to do long ago. Oh, well, if this is set up if I've ever heard it. Also, long ago? What does that mean? <laughs> That's the reason why I'm like, Daglin, Daglin, instantly Daglin. But Lexi's not on team Daglin Death Gods. It's fine. <laughs> I don't think he's a Daglin at all. No. I think he's a Daglin. I think he's a Daglin. <laughs> then, quote, Lucian stared out the window as if he could see the lake across a sea and a continent, as if he were setting his target. This could be set up for what Lucian's storyline is going to be in an upcoming book, Freeing Vasa, which might be part of like their love story. I definitely think that Lucian is going to be central to freeing Vasa. And I do think that there is going to be a little bit of a love story with them. And that is part of what might make him and Elaine eventually be together because she's got Asriel, he's got Vasa, and then they ultimately choose to be together again. Again, I have no idea. But speaking of Lucian and Vasa, I know I was saying this earlier, but there are so many hints that they are more than Band of Exile buddies. I am convinced that there are feelings between them, but he's not acting on anything yet because he is a mated male. But with his mate not wanting anything to do with him, he is able to connect with someone else. Not saying they're in game by any means, but Vasa offers Lucian what he desperately needs, which is connection. And I don't think that they're romantically involved yet, no. but there is some something, something there. There's a friendship brewing. And just like, I keep on going back to recent favors, but that's because that is so central to the plot of Akatar. It is their love story. And Reese and Feyre were friends long before they ever got together. And I honestly see Lucian and Vasa being similar. No, again, not, I don't, I truly don't know who's going to end up with who out of the whole Asriel, Elaine, Lucian, triangle, not a triangle situation. But 
what I'm seeing on the page, I'm definitely seeing what you're seeing, which is some kind of chemistry starting. So so I will say this, when Vasa was talking about the queens and how they're well-versed in treachery before they even contacted Highburn and how they've dealt with greater monsters, which she's referring to Koshje, and what the human queens did to her and selling her out to Koshje, quote, both Durian and Lucian stared at her. The former's face utterly unreadable, which is Durian, and the latter's pained. Yes. Eris says how the night court would be divvied up between the other territories, quote, if Rhysand and Feyre die without an heir. Yes, this is foreshadowing that Feyre and Rhys will eventually have a baby, but also literally what the fuck is he talking about? No, no, it wouldn't. It would just go to someone else. Did we all forget about summer, day, and winter? Their families were killed by Amarantha, and that's how Calias, Helion, and Tarquin came into power. We know that Tarquin was still related as a cousin to the previous High Lord, but not like, you know, in the immediate family that was unfortunately all killed off. That makes me think maybe more would be the one to come into power or actually probably even Kier since High Lordship passes down to males. Unless maybe there's a law against someone in the Hewn City getting that title, which in that case, if no one in the Hewn City can and he doesn't have any other male family members outside of the Hewn City, then that is the only way I could see this happen. But then it would go to anyone else. <laughs> anyone, anyone else. <laughs> yes, because the way that the magic works is it doesn't just say, oh, okay, there is nobody. It chooses someone. Yes. Did SJM just forget about this, I guess? Because Eris should know this. Like, he is a High Lord's son. And also, I think also, it just needed to be foreshadowing for there to be a baby. Oh my God. <laughs> infuriating. I, Cauldron boil me. It's time to sip some tea with the cereal. I need cold, hard facts right now. Every episode, Lexi will sip some tea with the cereal and walk us through a world building topic to help us better understand this world because we need it and the people in it. Today's cereal topic is Cassian's backstory. Shout out to our Discord members, Bree, Brittany, and Lindsay for helping me fill in the gaps of this beast of a cereal. This was a big one, everybody. So get ready here. I'm going to be using the same timeline years that I used in Akamath episode three when I did the entire timeline of the inner circle. But this time it's just about Cassian. Cassian was born one year after Azriel and one year before Reese and Moore. He was born a bastard nobody, which automatically meant a tough upbringing. He was the result of his sire forcing himself on his mother, a laundress in an Illyrian war camp. His mother was sadly shunned for bearing a child out of wedlock and had to give birth to Cassian alone in a tent in the dead of winter. Meanwhile, there were no consequences for his piece of shit father, who just went back to his wife and family. Cassian only has murky memories from these early years with his mother. He remembers mud and cold and two small fires, and the only thing he recalls about his mother were her litting, soft voice, and gentle, slender hands. At the age of three, when he was only three years old, after he was weaned from his mom and could walk, Cassian was taken away from her and thrown in Windhaven to see if he'll live or die. Disgraced and alone, his mother became prey to those ruthless Illyrians, and Cassian would later learn that she was worked to death. As a bastard child in this new war camp, he received nothing and had to find his own shelter, food, and clothes. So Cassian resorted to challenging other kids to fight and took their clothes as a prize. All right, so moving on to his childhood now in Windhaven. Haven. In 14,573, when Cassian was nine years old, six years after arriving and surviving against the odds at Windhaven, Reese was brought to the same war camp to begin his Illyrian training. Cassian was excited to meet his match in a worthy opponent, and he proceeded to beat Reese into a bloody mess for his new clean training clothes. This cost them both three lashings each, which, remember, is more of an encouragement to keep fighting by Illyrian standards. That night, while Cassian slept in his lonesome scrappy tent outside the camp. Reese woke him up and took him to his house at the edge of camp. Reese's mother, an Illyrian seamstress, now made it to the High Lord of the Night Court, took Cassian in. From then on, she gave him a home and shelter, tutored him alongside Reese, and treated him like a second son. She really resonated with him because she had previously been in a very tough position too and wanted to make sure that this little boy had a roof over his head and a warm bed to sleep in. But all of that said, Reese and Cassian still hated each other. A year later, 
Azriel was brought to Windhaven when he was 11 years old. Reese's mom took him in too. And Cassian was the first to find Azriel trying to unsuccessfully teach himself to fly. Cassian mocked him, beat him up, and then offered to train him. Reese joined the two the next day, and Cassian and Reese taught Azriel to fly. And that's when Reese and Cassian stopped hating each other, and the three young Bat Boys formed an alliance together. They realized everyone else hated them enough that they had better odds of survival sticking together. Over the next decade, they grew up training at Windhaven. Cassian, Reese, and Azriel became brothers, and it was clear they were the most powerful and strongest Illyrian novices in training. It's like the cauldron knew they'd be set apart at the beginning of their lives and wanted them to find each other. As their power grew, Cassian and Azriel became the first bastard-born Illyrians to ever receive a siphon. And they didn't just receive one or even two. No, they each got seven. Seven! Which is absolutely unheard of for Illyrians. You can imagine that when these siphons were begrudgingly appointed to them, every warrior in every Illyrian camp started really sizing them up. It's unknown when exactly, but when he was old and strong enough, Cassian came back to the camp where he was born in search for his mother. He discovered that the males of the camp had worked his mother until she died, so he killed them all, and the people remaining at this blood-splattered camp did not stay, so they migrated, leaving this once busy war camp in ruin. It took Cassian 10 years before he was able to face what he did to these males and what he lost in his mother and humanity. Like he went on a crazy killing rampage with all of that. In 14,582, when Cassian was 18 years old and Moore was 17, Moore was about to be forced into marriage with Eris, son of the High Lord of Autumn. She was visiting Reese at an Illyrian training camp, but he, his mom, and Az had to go to the night court. So Cassian and Moore found themselves alone. She wanted her first time to be with the greatest of Illyrian warriors, and they bangity banged. It's unclear if this was before or after the blood rite. I think before, even though she calls Cassian a warrior, when technically he wouldn't be yet. Anyway, this caused a lot of drama. Reese was mad at Cassian because of the danger this put Moore in with her family and marriage. Cassian and Reese fought, though Moore defused the situation by insisting to Reese that it was her decision. After Eris heard his bride was deflowered by a bastard Illyrian, he broke off the engagement. And Moore's family, who rules the night court, punished her and dumped her in the autumn court with a note nailed to her belly saying she was Eris's problem now. Azriel rescued her and brought her back to Valaris, where she's been a central part of the inner circle ever since and become like a sister to Cassian. To this day, Cassian has hated Eris and Moore's family with a fiery passion for what they did to his friend. Like all other Illyrian novices, we can assume they're usually in their late teens, early 20s. Reese, Cassian, and Azriel participated in the Blood Rite. The Blood Rite is an Illyrian rite of passage to become a true warrior. It occurs every year and several hundred participate. They cannot use magic or their wings and have no weapons, just the clothes on their back when they enter. They have one week to reach the sacred mountain Romiel and try to touch the onyx monolith at the top. Our Illyrian trio were purposefully separated for the blood rite so they couldn't work together. But hey, they found each other anyway and completed the blood rite. Well, actually, they won the blood rite by scaling the summit and touching the onyx monolith at the top, which made them Krithian warriors. This most elite level of Illyrian warrior has only been achieved three other times in the past 500 years. Huzzah! In 14,593, the war began in which the Night Court fought for the freedom of mortals. Reese's father and High Lord didn't like that his son allied with two very powerful Illyrian warriors, so he separated the trio during the seven years of the war. While Reese led an Illyrian legion who hated him and Azriel became the High Lord's shadow singer, Cassian was put in a different legion as a common foot soldier, even though his power outranked any of the war leaders. The three males only saw each other on battlefields for the whole war. When casualty lists were sent around the Illyrians, they would read each one worried that they'd see their friends' names on it. As a grunt in the Illyrian Legion, Cassian fought beside the Valkyries in the war for five battles. Most of the Valkyries died at the Battle of Minyar Pass in their attempt to save it. Cassian had tried to convince the Illyrians to help them, but his superiors beat him senseless, chained him to a supply wagon, and left him there. By the time he came to, the battle was over and the Valkyries were slain. His first love beyond the Night Court's borders was a bold-hearted Valkyrie named Tanwin. 
That's not confusing. <laughs> she rode into that battle at the head of the Valkyries. But unfortunately, she never came out of the pass. Once Reese became High Lord an unknown number of decades or even a century later, he appointed Amran as his second and Morris as third, Azriel his spymaster, and Cassian commander of his armies. As Reese said, quote, Cassian is the best warrior I've encountered in any court, any land. He leads my armies because of it. Most of the court was not happy about Reese appointing his, quote, unworthy friends to high positions like Cassian. And now those people are either dead or keep to themselves and run things in the court of nightmares. Over the past three to four centuries, Cassian has been responsible for commanding the Illyrian armies and overseeing the war camps. But he only has so much sway over their leaders, as in barely any, as they're so set in their ways. He does comprehensive inspections of the legions in Illyria and does his best to keep things in check. Cassian has also put some of the creatures in the prison and seems to have a morbid fascination with all of the prison's inmates. For instance, he jailed Lanthus after he tricked him into getting trapped in a mirror, as well as a seven-headed Lubia and Blue Anis. Around 14,900, which is 200 years ago, Reese dared Cassian to fly to the bottom of the library in the House of Wind to see what was at the bottom. Cassian encountered the terror that is Braxis for the first time. <laughs> and to this day, still won't talk about it. But we can't forget that over these centuries, the Bat Boys continue having their annual snowball fight on winter solstice. And of course, Cassian was banned from the summer court since destroying a building there. I wish we had more information on that because that sounds like fun. So that's what Cassian was doing until 15,050. Reese went to Amarantha's ball alone in hopes of killing her. Instead, she stole all the High Lord's powers and enslaved the courts of Perithian, except Valaris, because Reese used the last of his power to give it extra protection and warn his friends of what happened and that the Valaris protections only hold if they stay there. For the next 50 years, things were tense between the remaining Inner Circle members and Valaris. The Illyrians went unchecked, and it wasn't until Reese returned from under the mountain to Two years ago, he, Cassian, and Azriel spent three months killing the Illyrian bands who had sided with Amarantha. And then our story begins, which you all know. And that, friends, is Cassian's backstory. Wow. Whew. Bravo, <laughs> madam. Oh, my God. Let's close out the Akatar part of our episode with our favorite moments. Kicking it off with Nesta almost chucking a vase at Cassian, which definitely reminds me of another Archeron sister actually chucking something at their mate. I adore the budding relationship between Nesta and Clotho. On her first day, Nesta quips that no one likes a liar. And it isn't malicious, and I didn't even read it as rude, but it's almost a little teasing, and yes, certainly self-deprecating. She needed to get away from the inner circle and meet new people, start fresh. And you can really see that not only in her friendships with Emery and Gwyn, but also people like Clotho. Cassian brings up a really good point. What? The fuck is Jurian? Quote, once human, partially human? He didn't know. Jurian has been a consciously alive piece of jewelry, then made with a capital M by the cauldron. So is Jurian made? Like considered made? Is he a human? Is he something new? I truly have no idea. I agree. I don't know either because he doesn't have any of like the fey powers, at least that we know of. He's certainly not fey, but he also doesn't seem fully human either. So yeah. I don't know. I wonder if he's actually going to turn out to be something kind of like Miriam, who is still in her human body, but she becomes immortal from the fourth item that had been made by the cauldron. Miriam's half fey though. Yes, she is. But she was resurrected because oh, yes. of this item from the cauldron. And that is when she then got her immortality. Oh, possibly. So then if the thruple oh does end up happening, then Listen, I am not against thruples. Like, please do not get me wrong. I just don't think that <laughs> these three are one. <laughs> well, we will see on that, sister. Every delicious moment in the dining room where Nesta thinks she's being so smart with her quote. I bet that isn't what you've been telling yourself at night, quip. Asriel laughs and Cassian comes back with a quote, you think it's only at night? And then Nesta shuts up <laughs> and Asriel's biting his lip laughing. It's just, I love this dynamic between the three of them. It's so fun. Also, when Cassian says that Nesta fell down the stairs to Asriel, Asriel's response is, quote, did someone push you? 
I don't think this is supposed to be funny. Probably not. But every time I imagine it, it's deadpan in my head and it is hilarious. Well, and then it's also he's insinuating that Cassian pushed her and it's like, <laughs> oh, I didn't ever think about it that way. Oh, that's I, how I always took it, where it's like, did someone push you? And, and Cassian's like, like, dude, I wouldn't <laughs> do that. <laughs> I love that. I like that. That's good. As Nesta is at dinner with Cassian and as her power starts to rise within her and she pushes it down as best she can without her usual vices. Instead, she's taking a sip of water and it helps her bring herself back to the present. That is a huge, small win there for Nesta. End quote. Cassian always needed physical contact, he learned, probably thanks to a childhood spent with precious little of it. Cassian's love language is absolutely physical touch. No wonder absolutely. you love him so much. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, that's mine too. And like, I love it so much. Yep. What is Nesta's? Because I'm trying to think of it and I'm I'm stumped. I think we'll figure it out in the deep dive though. I would almost say it might be words of affirmation. That was going back and forth between that one and quality time. I think once she gets past her attitude that she has right now, it gets into both of those for sure. But I don't know. We'll be on the lookout for that. All right, friends, we are about to begin our mass verse madness section. But before we do, we want to give the biggest thank you to our newest Inner Circle members. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts, really and truly for your support. We appreciate you so, so, so much. So a huge thank you and shout out to Ashlyn, Alexis, Jin He, Cassie G, Jeannie May, Michelle, Amanda D, Jedum, Kristen B, Julie D, and Manda. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and welcome, welcome, welcome. Today's Mass vs. Madness includes spoilers for the whole Throne of Glass and Crescent City series. So if you haven't read all the books, this is when we part ways. But first, reminder that next episode, we will be covering Silver Flames chapters 12, through 19. And if you're like, hey, I want my name right off on the podcast and get showered with love too, be sure to join the Patreon party. Also, do not forget to sign up for the Fantasy Fangirls newsletter. We only send you one email a month and it's packed with lots and lots of information like what Lexi and I are reading, a trivia question, books from the community, a small store shout out, and so much more. So check that out and get signed up in the link in the show notes. And we are super active on social media, so please be sure to give us a follow for the full Fantasy Fangirls experience. Give us a follow at Fantasy Fangirls Pod on Instagram and TikTok. Also, do not forget to rate and review the podcast. It takes literally two seconds out of your day. And it's one of the best things that you can do, not only for this show, but for any show you regularly listen to. We are now entering our Mass First Madness segment of the episode, where we call out series crossover references and discuss theories. Today, we are discussing ideas with spoilers from the entire Mass Verse. So please only continue listening if you have read all of the books from Crescent City and Throne of Glass. All righty. Back to the Reese's last name conversation. There are, of course, some mass first theories around this. God, I love this community. Most popular being Danon, especially with the likeness to Rune. But we do know that Rune takes after his mother in likeness, and the Autumn King's last name is Danon. So unfortunately, I do think we can rule out Danon here. So that brings me to another one. What if his last name is Havilyard and Rune's mother's last name was Havilyard? And there's just a bunch of these Havilyard lines in these different worlds. However, here's the wrench. Gavin Havilyard was the first Havilyard that we know of in Dorian's line, and he is human. So it could be Celine's blood is still running through the Havilyard's line, and that's the human line that the bone carver was referring to, which Celine does look like Reese's sister. So that's not out of the question. However, there's also the idea, and I love this idea, it's that Reese's last name could be something absolutely ridiculous. We've had Fenris Moonbeam and Lorcan became Lorcan Luckin. So I'm leaning more towards this option. And like, what if Reese's name is like Nighthawk or something like that? Like, I am Nighthawk. <laughs> you must call me Nighthawk. I am Dragon. <laughs> Shout out if you've seen that meme. It went super viral and I was very proud of myself. <laughs> it was so fun. I love that meme. So here is a question, though. Do we ever know what Fionn and Thea's last name is? No, we do not. Because we know that Celine marries the High Lord of the Night Court, so it probably wouldn't go through her line with the last name. But anyway. That's a last name we're not being told for a reason, for sure. I'm probably going to be in the minority here, and this is not fun whatsoever. But I think that we, as a fandom, are looking into the last names a little more than SJM. And she just didn't come up with last names. Yeah, I think we're all so starved for anything Akatar that we're like, it's recent Nighthawk. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, moving on to my second and final Mass vs. Madness. It's a short one today. Nesta falling down the stairs. When she does fall down the stairs, Nesta, quote, blinked at her hand. She'd seen sparks. With all the witch and witchcraft language around Nesta, people wonder if there is some witchness in her lineage. And there's some theories wondering if she tapped into almost having iron teeth claws in this moment. Personally, I actually wonder if this is more her starborn power, if she is of the starborn line, which I'm convinced she is. We never see Bryce use any starborn power that sparks come about, but maybe the parasite in the water could be dimming it. So in my opinion, this is Nesta accidentally tapping into starborn magic. So I I do think that this is specifically referring to her silver flames, which we know Nessa will wield very specifically in House of Flame and Shadow. All right, friends, next episode, next Monday, we are covering chapters 12 through 19 of Silver Flames. Thank you, as always, to our executive producer, Hayden, a.k.a. our sanity manager. We are sorry for this episode. We were giggle monsters this entire thing. We love you. Also, shout out to Hayden, too, for coming into town this past weekend for our live show. We appreciate you so much and it couldn't have been what it was without you. We love you. Of course, like every episode, share this episode with your fellow Silver Flames friends. If you and your friends are pissed at Nesta for not getting her ass off, it's not a boulder, it's a rock. And especially if you and your friends know what that reference is from, then please do share this episode with them. It's from SpongeBob, everybody, in case you didn't know. (laughs) (laughs) All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We will see you next week. Bye-bye. So with all of that said, if you don't know why Eris is so... Fuck. (laughs) (laughs) See? Eris is soldiers. Shoot. I realized there's a plate behind me this whole... You now realize Hayden, this is what happens when I zoom out. <laughs> you realize now it's going to call attention to the plate because it'll be there in one frame and then be gone the next. <laughs>